people say sometimes that it doesn't sink in or, or I guess you build it up to be pretty big. Like I was always a bit of a dreamer and would use the crossing the line, the, the medal or the anthem or whatever to sort of inspire me through the dark moments. So I built it up to be a pretty huge thing. And then when it actually happened, I'll be honest, it was worth about a hundred times more than I ever thought it was going to be. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Row Counts. We've got an absolute legend of rowing in the house today, a proper household name. Please welcome Tim Foster to the podcast. I'm very happy to be here. I'd sort of suggest more legends than legend. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's the name now for those athletes, a uh, little bit from, from back in the day, uh, as it is now. Time moves on. But um, yeah, no, awesome, awesome to, to come and sit down um, and do this. And uh, again, just just doing a bit of research and looking up uh, your results. It's it's an incredibly impressive run um, just to go through it. So <laughs> started in '87 in junior worlds, gold in the four minus, '88 gold in the two minus, then straight into junior, uh, straight to senior worlds, '89 bronze in the eight. 94th, 91 bronze, Olympics 92, 6th in the 8th, Worlds again 93, 5th, 94 bronze, 95 silver, 96 Olympics bronze, again 4 minus that time, back to 97, first senior world gold, 98 gold, 99 silver, and obviously finishing uh, in uh, the Olympics in 2000 with uh, with that final gold. And just obviously knowing a little bit of your history and, and the issues you had with your back, to make the senior worlds or Olympics every single year from when you started in 87 to 2000 is, is an absolute incredible achievement. And I'm sure we'll go into the, what goes into being able to be that consistent. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a little taste of sort of what you've achieved. Actually, it, it, it's quite nice to listen to. Obviously some of those are quite a long time ago, but brings back some happy memories. And actually, ah. yeah, I mean, it was a lovely and sort of fantastic journey with, with highs and lows, which I'm happy to, yeah, yeah. to describe, but I mean, no, no, it's a, from yeah. from eighty seven to two thousand, a final every year is is incredible. That's yeah. right to hold. And hold I guess yourself. without sort of trying to sort of big myself up, it was probably an era as well where British rowing wasn't as well funded, wasn't as professional. Yeah, um, it was much more down to individuals and down to kind of partnerships that you made yourself rather than having this sort of national team that was was so well organized so yeah. so actually yeah yeah i can't deny it's something i'm, I'm quite proud of it's quite good it's another thing uh, having guests on this other podcast and maybe when i read that out or just as we start talking through it you know there is stuff that just kind of rolls into one and then you get to be like oh that was that was pretty good yeah. that was a good ride oh yeah i mean the medals are nice it's the stories it's the it's the experiences yeah. i mean behind each one of them is is not just the series of races it's the yeah the I mean, I overuse the word journey, but yeah, it's the journey. It's the yeah. it's the bits that went well, the bits that didn't go well, yeah, yeah. the life that had to revolve around it. And I think again, having done some research for guests we've had, and <clears throat> it's funny, you know, obviously Steve got five in a row. Matt went on and did it, and it and it kept going. And that, like, I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, GB one gold again. And, oh yeah, they'll get it. Oh, they'll just nail it. And then you know, looking back at like the Sydney final, it was like you never got away. And like, mm-hmm. it's like point three something. Yeah. Yeah, you know, obviously 2004 as well. Like, there's so many close um, races, and yeah, it's uh, like you said. Like, that's just that's just the final sort of headline. Yeah, uh, and I think what's been really interesting about this podcast is just kind of delving into the back and finding out what goes into it. And obviously, so much more goes into it. Exactly, is the is the trials, tribulations, the camaraderie, is the fu- the fun parties, and and everything, and a lot of hard training, a lot of hard miles, and and also a lot of sacrifices. So. Definitely super happy to to have you on here, and you have been a, a requested guest very much. <laughs> also, some of our other guests have named you as their rowing hero, so very very pleased to to be doing this. No, I mean, it, 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 it's lovely when people do say nice things. Maybe it feels me, it makes me feel a little bit old, and that yeah, maybe when they were this high, they looked up at me, and now they're that high. And <laughs> so um, yeah, things do change. Yeah, it moves on quick though, doesn't it? With rowing, yeah, um, no, again, uh, Alex Partridge was saying ninety six. Uh, he was looking at Pinson Red Raven being, oh, I want to I go to the Olympics. And then 
Uh, before was finding himself in a, in a boat with one of them. So yeah. Um, yeah, it goes it goes fast. But we'll get into that more a bit now, uh, a bit later. But now, yeah, let's let's start as we normally do with um, how you got into rowing in the first place. Um, I guess I was one of the ones that got into it by accident. I, I grew up in Bedford, um, went to Bedford Modern, and started rowing there when I was was fourteen. I was a, I guess a, a teenager that wanted to do everything. I wanted to. You know, do every single sport I wanted to play in a rock band I wanted to do absolutely everything and rowing was something I'd seen because the river runs through the middle of the town and yeah you can't live in Bedford without seeing rowing it's a bit like living here in Oxford to be honest yeah. and um I gave it a go wasn't very good at it didn't like not being very good at it so I came back um ended up having some friends that also wanted to try it who were wanting to carry on say over a summer holiday and I think that was where I started to make a bit of a difference and started to realize it was something I was yeah, better at than than other sports I, I love my football I used to love playing cricket and rugby and rugby particularly I got away with because I was sort of bigger than other people and therefore um yeah looked like I might be able to play rugby but when the levels got harder mm. and other people got bigger it was the realization actually I'm not really very good at rugby I'm <laughs> I'm actually much better at this this sport called rowing. So, yeah, when I was 16, I probably started to take it a bit more seriously. Yeah. Um, actually started to win some races, which I hadn't done at all for a couple of years. I spent a year and a half not winning a single race. And, yeah, that's, I think, part of the, the kind of foundation that was actually quite important for me because yeah. we were a school that, didn't really have any coaches, still had wooden boats. So we're going back a few years, wooden boats and wooden oars. And um, it was actually, I mean, the first race we won was at Cambridge Sprint. I've still got the, the pewter tankard somewhere. Oh. <laughs> um, very proud. And I should probably thank David Honeywell, who was our bowman, who actually came off his seat off the start and rode the whole race on his bum, basically going backwards and forwards and no. didn't stop, didn't give up. <laughs> sort of, um, but I think, all of us rowers have a story like that and you have to start somewhere and and actually for me it was a really I think good beginning because I could enjoy it yeah I could be competitive it was an era where sports at school you weren't allowed to be competitive um there was a lot of sort of push towards non-competitive sports except in rowing you could still sort of race and I liked racing I liked to win um I liked the environment that I was in and wasn't really quite sure where it was going to take me. Yeah, well, I know. No one ever does know. Mm. And when you start out, yeah, like, it's it's got to be fun, hasn't it? It's got to be fun to start with. And I think it's maybe something we're missing a little bit or in the in the modern era, as things get really serious, you see kids take it really, really serious really early. Um, I mean, I, I completely, I mean, my daughter's now just started rowing and okay. she's sort of dragging me back to the riverbank and actually watching her, but to me, the biggest talent is to enjoy it. Yeah. That actually, how or why did I become sort of good at it? It was because I came back and I came back with a smile and I had a group of friends that did the same thing and they didn't necessarily have the same career as me, but I think they could sit here now and still recount very similar stories of fun and and, and winning. And there wasn't a lot of science, I guess, in in, in my early years in, the, in Bedford. The river's about 1,800 metres long. Lots of bends go under a bridge. Anyone that's raced there kind of probably sort of realised this. But all our training sessions were were row up to the top and race back. Yeah. And then you go in. And so actually, when I went a little bit further in rowing and made the first junior trial, actually, it was over eight kilometres. And I'd, I'd never rowed eight kilometres in one training session before. Wow. Um, so it was like, well, like, like, I'll be allowed to stop at any point. Because, <laughs> yeah. And then we go back to the fun. But, yeah three, four, five times a week. Um, I mean, even on the rowing machine. Like, we had one rowing machine at school, so I'd go down on a Tuesday, Thursday, Friday morning. And in those days, rather than 2,000 metres, you'd do a six-minute test, and every morning we'd do a six-minute test because that's all kind of what you had to do. Yeah. Didn't know any different. But Just get on with it. By the end of the year, you get quite good at six-minute tests. Yeah, it's something I noticed, again, with coaching, you can push and push and push, but actually, if you can just make it fun, the, and get the athletes hooked then they'll push you yeah and they want to do more oh. and they'll and, and you'll find them doing their own extra sessions completely and there was a teacher at the school called 
Mr. Lucas or Tim Lucas, as I got knew him eventually. And he was really good at supporting us. He hadn't been much of a rower. I think he'd rowed at Cambridge at college level himself. And yet he allowed us, he basically gave us the key to the ergo room, gave us the key to the boathouse, kind of allowed us to come, was there when we needed him. And I remember even when I went to the first junior trial, he came up to me after a few days because I don't quite know what you're doing, but carry on. It's going quite well. <laughs> I think that's definitely when we spoke again before. That's such a draw of rowing is to be given some um, responsibility. Um, you know, in football, you know, at school, we're barely allowed to sign a football yeah. out of the cupboard without a teacher. So, you know, being able to go on the river and train on your own, like, I think that's a real draw to the kind of mentality of people that, that get into rowing. Yeah. Or just even being given keys to the ergo room and just being able to do sessions on your own. And also you saying that you only had one ergo at school. And rowing in wooden boats, like that's sort of how I remember rowing at the start, you know. And it just is a testament to the point that you you don't need perfect equipment in order to be really successful at something. You just have to enjoy it and you just have to keep wanting to come back. Oh, completely. And I think it sort of makes you in a way. Actually, the first time I used a, a plastic oar was at Junior Worlds. And like originally I'm windmilling because the thing's like 10 times lighter than any oar <laughs> I've, I've used previously, but you kind of get used to it. But I do think sometimes we get over kind of obsessed by having the perfect conditions or the perfect training environment or the perfect. I mean, even many years later, we went on a national training camp to Bulgaria where there was this gym where lots of world champions had, had, had come from, the world champion weightlifters, and we were expecting this most fantastic kind of facility. And effectively, it was a big room full of rusty, heavy weights yeah. and which had been obviously thrown around sort of by some strong people. And yeah, for me, in terms of rowing, again, probably what most obvious when I went to Switzerland, that they wouldn't row in a boat that was more than two years old. And in the end, ultimately, it's like, well, no, the boat's not the limiting factor. It's actually the engine that, that drives it that's ultimately going to decide yeah, how fast it goes. I remember being um, on the hard outside Leander for a session doing you know getting the boat ready and i'm listening to a junior quad behind me talk about how their quad was rubbish because it was like five or six years old and i i turned and like they didn't know any better they were they were new to rowing i was like guys i'm telling you <laughs> like until you rode in like a 20 year old yamasek which like bends completely in the you know i'd all be the happy place. with a 20 year old yamasek yeah. when i started rowing i won my first uh polish junior championships medal with a wooden end packer yeah. from the 70s and that was in 2012 so yeah. like when we got a boat that was 15 years old that was that was a luxury we yeah. didn't we didn't have anything like that yeah but i tell you i mean maybe without going sort of too heavy on it but i think you kind of have to wear this and that and actually to me probably in my own background it was it was self-responsibility it was learning kind of probably some of my own rowing style was developed because I was working it out for myself. I had to develop a feeling for how the boat was moving because there wasn't an expert on the side that was going to tell me, yes, no, yes, yes, no, no. Um, and some of that comes yeah, with the way that you're brought up. Some of it maybe is is your own intuition, but I think it's important that, that we get that foundation right. And yeah, sometimes it's not just athletes, it's coaches that can over-obsess. And I'm not saying, okay, if we, if we were planning for the Olympic final tomorrow, I'd I'd make sure we had the best equipment. I'd make sure we had the best preparation. And but that's the level to come when it when it's at the start. It's about getting on the water and yeah, and working it out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's definitely not a limiting factor. So you started to really take rowing seriously. You'd say about age of sixteen, and then that what that was when your ju uh, journey into the junior world championships had started. Yeah. So I guess I was a bit of a jack of all sports. So yeah, I. I I was good enough to make a school team or whatever, whether it be football, cricket or, or rugby. But rowing was becoming more and more the feature. And there was this sort of silly situation at school when I was 16 in that I'd played rugby before and they wanted me to be in the rugby team. But by this point, I decided I wanted to row. So despite being given a place in the first 15 for rugby, it was like, well, actually, I don't want to play. And no one had ever not wanted to play before it's not because i'm lazy it's not because uh -huh. i don't like sport it's actually because i want to be doing something else and i again was really lucky there was another teacher at school that really supported me and this probably goes back to part of my philosophy that none of us can do it on our own if it hadn't been for that teacher i'd have probably been in trouble at school because it would have been misconstrued as being difficult or being 
yeah, lazy, whereas actually I wanted to invest my time into rowing. So yeah, I was 16 then, got to go to the Anglo-French um, and actually for the first time raced Matthew Pinson to the Anglo-French. Hi. And, um, so that, that's I'm, now Coop. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And not GB France? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, GB yeah. France. So actually Coop, I think, was the other year. So, uh, okay. Um, Scott. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. You're right. Yeah, so I was, so there was a, there was under 18 and under 16. Under 16 is GB France. Uh, yeah. And um, Matthew was in an eight and eight, and I was in the bedroom bottom eight, um, albeit they were, I was rowing up a couple of years, um, and actually we beat him, so that's the reason for mentioning it here. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's, um, <laughs> but it was an exposure, but again, it was it was a trip to Sheffield, which probably wasn't the most, like, like the most exotic, but it was a trip, Yeah, and actually you got to stay and you got to race against the French, albeit the, the bit I won't mention is that both French hates beat both. English eight, so I mean, okay, I've mentioned the fact I beat Matthew, but that, yeah, um, but that got things started. I had a friend called Pete, sort of at the at the school. He was like a fantastically talented at anything he did. He was one of the top chemists in the country. He played kind of an instrument in the like the National Youth Orchestra, and he rode with me, and we rode a pair, and we started to go a bit more outside of the immediate area of Bedford because traditionally we raced in Cambridge at St. Neats at Bedford. Mm-hmm. And we actually went up to Nottingham for the first time and raced against what was um, one of the recognised GB pairs there. It was Toby Hessian and Paul Dilks. And actually showed you how naive and stupid we were because we jumped out of the app. There was a school eight. We literally jumped out, didn't change any of the rigging on the oars, anything like that. We didn't know anything about that jumped into a pair and the racing was over 1500 meters in those days and after 500 meters meters we were eight seconds up uh, against this pair that was supposed to be quite good so oh, after a thousand meters we were six seconds up at the end we were just about enough up but actually earned to ourselves an invite to the junior trials on the back of that because yes. actually we'd beaten an established pair albeit we'd come from nowhere no one quite knew if we were any good mm-hmm. so on the back of that Pete and myself got invited to junior trials, which was at the end of the season after Henley. Um, Pete didn't go to the junior trials because actually it clashed with I think the National Youth Orchestra or a chemistry Olympiads that he was doing, which actually, if you speak to him now, I think he regrets because he went on to have a sort of fantastic career in academia, but didn't really continue his rowing career, which happens. But it meant I turned up at the junior trials without a pairs partner. At that time, I wasn't a sculler at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to sit a little bit out of the trials when they did pairs. But then when they went into Cox Falls, I, I jumped in. And having been told that I might get into the Worlds team was, was what they thought because yeah, there were 25 people who were probably going to get to the Worlds. And yeah, the challenge was to get into the top 25. Um, I ended up basically coming number one. And it was like, Actually, every seat race I did, the boat I was in won, which was quite nice. Even somebody as naive as me sort of realised, well, actually, things are going quite well. And this is when Tim Lucas came up to me with, yeah, don't quite know what you're doing, but carry on. <laughs> um, and that was like this seminal change in my rowing career. I mean, having thought I was taking it seriously previous to that, I suddenly found myself in the top boat for Junior Worlds um, with guys who'd won silver medals the year before GB at that point had never won the junior world so it was quite a, mm-hmm. a big sort of thing to be in the top boat and to try and win for the first time but yeah it was it was amazing and again I remember speak, speaking to my dad who was a massive follower of like really supportive and again without parental support there's no way I was gonna do it like he was my taxi service mum was food delivery <laughs> um and I remember speaking to him basically to arrange a a lift back from Peterborough and he goes, oh, how did it go? And I was like, well, actually, I'm in a, I'm in a four. He goes, oh, who are you with? And I thought, yeah, Johnny Searle, Rupert Opulsa, Toby Hershon. He goes, they're quite good, aren't they? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think they're, they're quite good. because, oh, I'll see you in an hour. And basically his brain had started to go. And I remember having the chat with him 30 odd years later where it was like, yeah, he'd gone back and told my mother because I think Tim's done quite well. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome do you think it helps being in, involved in that racing sort of like I said naivety not not worrying not overthinking it I guess also potentially you know I've been in some of those junior spring assessments where they just race you to death you're doing like nine ten races a day for four days and you have no idea what's going on 
you were used to that. Yeah. You didn't have a coach. It wasn't a problem just getting a I race. 100% honest, yeah. I completely do because I remember, yeah, there was this session, whatever it was, four, they told you that you wouldn't do more than 20 times, 1,000 <laughs> meters, and, and end up you end up doing 14, 15. Yeah. But for me, that was normal, like rub up to the top and race back down. Yeah. It was the way I'd been brought up. So what I actually honestly struggled on was when they said, do an hour of steady state, which I'd never done. Yeah. Um, because I'd blown up after five minutes because I had no idea how to, to pace myself. I would just go. Yeah. And actually the trials, I think, helped me because, yeah, without overcomplicating it, I just got in and, and rode. And probably, again, one of my advantages was like work it out for yourself. So no matter who I was with, I'd sit there and make some adjustments yeah, yeah. to make you comfortable or to make sure you can get your power on. And yeah. That was possibly what... What, what helped me in the That's the absolute skill of, of some athletes who can who can yeah just make the boat work for the other people around them. If you can't rely on the rigging, you have to rely on the feel and like how you balance the boat and just, just it comes down to the technique of your own, isn't it? Yeah, and when you're sea racing, it's you don't you don't have an hour to look at all yeah. your little settings and make all your tiny little changes. It's like jump in the boat, race to the top, work it out. Yeah, and I, don't, I, don't, I would claim, and I don't know whether it's again going back to background, there's probably a bit of sort of talent of what I had, that ability to feel it. But that was always something even at the end of my career. If you put me in a pair with someone, I'll I'll make you feel comfortable. Um if you put me in a pair now, I won't make it go fast, but it might be comfortable. I don't know. But um actually that was a real challenge. Say whether it was seat racing, whether it was some of the other trials we did, whether it was some of the boats and the people you row with, some rowers have other skills some rowers have like they can generate huge positive numbers mm -hmm. and actually given the right platform that's the reason your boat's ultimately going to go fast i'll be honest if you had if you had four of me in the boat we could accommodate each other but ultimately it wasn't going to be the fastest boat in the world um but yeah in certain teams i was in i had some sort of big positive number generators that could could do that side of thing if i can help them yeah Set up the platform. I think that's a funny thing to say for someone who pulled a 552. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but actually, that was part of the challenge ultimately. And having said that actually it was yeah, about the background I had, as I got further up the ladder or further up the standard, and this is one thing Jürgen was particularly good at. Like I remember coming to Jürgen, this was a fairly successful athlete coming out of the 96 world, he goes, well, there were things you can still work on. There are still physical things that will not detract from what you're already good at, but you do also need to be more physical. You do also need to... Yeah, working, but, working on your weak points, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there's always something to work on. Like you said, different people didn't bring different um, skills. And then, again, that's sort of the skill of a coach to drop them in. Like, yeah. I think, you know, when you look at something like the the Rio 8, you know, a real mix of, mm. like, like, incredible oarsmen, massive engines sort of in that mix together making ultimately faster than the, the part of its yeah you know of its parts yeah and i think it's great having a coach come up to you and also say that despite how successful you are there are still things you can improve on because if you've run out of things that you can improve on that's when you need to start getting worried and completely and it's a little bit out of the timeline but the history of me and jürgen was quite interesting because when jürgen came over in 1990 he was the under coach and i wasn't the under the national team in those days was very split. You had a London group and you had a Leander group. And I was in the London group. And actually, despite Jürgen's history and his success he'd had in East Germany, there was a, a reticence to admit that within London. But actually, we did things in a different way. We thought we were better than them. Exactly the same, vice versa. They, they thought they were better than us. They went very much in down the scientific route. And there was even this example where we went to Banyolis on training camp and shows you how dysfunctional the national team was, but we stayed in our London and Leander group. So Leander group would get up, crack a dawn and do 20K restricted heart rate. Leander group would get up at 10 and do six times 500 just to spite each other. Kind of, and actually the whole thing polarized. And it resulted in the 91 worlds where effectively you had a London eight and you had a Leander or Hendy group as it was, mm. um, sort of pair and Cox's four. And the eight, actually, we'd got a, a bronze medal. And to be fair to Jürgen, who was this uber successful coach already, he was, um, yeah, if not already, the most successful rowing coach. He was well on his way to being. And he reached over and he said to me, you know, I was a 21-year-old sort of, sort of stupid athlete, really, that was out to prove a point. 
And he goes, actually, Tim, I, Jürgen, have got something you can teach me because I've got no idea how you go fast. Come on. And Jürgen's point was like he always wanted to, I think, reduce that X factor of what wasn't controllable. Mm. And what he could see in me was like, he says, guess you, you're bottom of my list of this, you're bottom of my list of that, you're bottom of this. But you don't go fast. What is it? Like, kind of, well, actually, to me, that was the start of my relationship, really, I guess, with Jürgen in that the fact that he was willing to, to make the first move, for which I was probably too stubborn to do. I thought it was actually really impressive. I think it's funny. I, again, speaking to to a lot of athletes of different levels, and we've had some fantastic athletes on now. Um, don't underestimate the, the mental power of being the underdog. And it's funny that at every level, no matter how good people are, if you have an opportunity to make yourself feel like an underdog, you yeah. will. Yeah. Because it, there's there's real strength in it, and there's something that people quite often struggle with. Is then moving from being no longer the underdog, and it's a it's a huge. You're like, oh, well, I'm just chancing it, having a go, seeing what we can do. Then you win a medal, then you go into the top boat, and next year you're like, whoa, and like now everyone's chasing us, and that's a very different yeah. place to be. Yeah, and actually, the biggest example of that was was for us in the Sydney Four. Yeah, I mean, or in Atlanta, despite the fact we were a successful four, this was with with Johnny Sell, Greg Sell, Rupert Opholzer, and myself. Despite the fact we'd we have all had success before we played very much on being the underdog. Whereas in the Sydney four, there was no option to win Stevie's first silver. I mean, that just wasn't <laughs> yeah. something you ever kind of yeah. wanted to be known for was, yeah, yeah, you helped him win silver. Great. Kind of, yeah. it was about winning a fifth gold. And I think actually it was one of the things I definitely learned from Steve particularly was how to cope with being a favorite because you're a favourite for a reason. Actually, there's the confidence that you can get from that. There's the the way you conduct yourself, the way you train, the way you challenge yourself in a slightly different way. Yeah. But you did have to learn that, and I do think a lot of people struggle. Yeah. Um, because they have to be at the underdog. Yeah. They have to be the one that so it's us against them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so rolling back slightly, then. So obviously, like you said, so your your first junior worlds gold. That's the first gold that GB's ever got. Yeah. At a junior yeah, level. First first junior gold that Britain. God, it wasn't by much. It was by about 0.4 of a second, which sort of wrapped my career sort of fairly nicely <laughs> in the Cox of the Sport. So, uh, but yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was in Cologne. Um, yeah, we rode through the Soviet Union as it was there, which sort of slightly shows that how far away, or how far how long ago it was. But that then set me up, and so the next year I was a returning junior. Yeah. Um, so now no longer the underdog. Yeah, now no longer the underdog, albeit. About two years previous, Great Britain had tried to win the pair. Like mm -hmm. you, you had not just Soviet Union, but you had East Germany in those days. And East Germany dominated junior rowing. Out of the fourteen events, they would win twelve, oh. um, and were just so far ahead. And we got the chance to go out to to East Germany actually a year or two later. And okay, there were things that they were doing that it was a shame they were doing. Because otherwise they were just so much better anyway. They had science, but no one else had science. They had accommodation, full-time athletes, professional coaches. They had a, a rowing course with cameras every 250 metres so coaches could sit in a room and watch. And we're going back 40-odd years. They, they had telemetry systems 40 years ago. Wow, really? Yeah. So wow. um, giving force profiles back in the 1980s. So it's 10... 20 years before, yeah. before we were doing So in 2002, well, by the time I'm now coaching, we're developing a tele telemetry system, which I think was effectively copying an East German system over the 30 odd years previous. So the shame was, yeah, the, of other stuff, but racing against the East Germans in those days was, was huge. Mm. And it was always known that the East Germans would put their top two junior athletes in the pair. And actually, they were doing the same in the seniors as well. But actually, having won the four in in 1987 um toby and johnny were no longer junior so they 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 but they'd moved on rupert was junior but got a back injury so wasn't really able to row for much of that year so i ended up pairing with this sort of young fresh-faced chap called matthew um who turned out to be quite a good rower <laughs> um, yeah. but at the time was sort of pretty raw and sort of inexperienced my bit actually was a real pleasure to row with ridiculous power but but needed a lot to i mean so was he that he that wouldn't have been 
He was a bit younger than you. He was the same year he'd he'd rode in the eighth the year before, okay. and I think had come fourth. Um, so I did know Matthew, um, but he was he was developing. I mm. mean, you could you could tell. I mean, pictures of him at the time is a bit more gangly than he was yeah. twenty odd years later, but already had his lung capacity, already had his talent, and it was a real sort of pleasure to be in the pair with him. Um, we rode the other way round at that point. I'd stroke it, and he'd be at, at bow, and. Um, the World Championships were in Milan that year. It was a real, I should race, I even remember now, there was us and the East Germans flying down the course because actually I think we did what's it, 447 for 1,500 metres. So racing was over 1,500 metres in those days. Yeah. Um, so actually the two pairs were going at a fair old pace and we ended up rowing through them. They'd got ahead and tried to stay ahead and eventually we'd we'd come through them. Um, but yeah, again, sort of bring sort of hairs on the back of my neck and makes me smile to remember it because I can say that's yeah like that's a that's a good one to win isn't it over someone that you knows doing much better again like you said even being on top in GB still feeling maybe like the underdog and you know, we don't have what they have we don't have the technology they have and we still don't yeah oh yeah and actually because they were recognized as top athletes in East Germany we kept we met them years later like one of them actually becomes and in, goes into the senior pair at one point and both of them went into the senior national team um, albeit, well, I mean, my German's still bad, but at the time was completely non-existent. But we'd we'd definitely give them a smile, even if they weren't always smiling back at us. It's like I had a slightly different memory of the race than we did. Yeah, I remember uh, before a big final at school once, and that school's final. Um, my coach gave quite a good speech, and he was saying he was like, "So the best thing about rowing is if you cross the finish line first, you kick the shit out of your opponent without even touching them." <laughs> You can have that sort of mental win, but you'd never even, you didn't have to have a fight. Yeah. You'd beaten them anyway. I think it is very different. And I know a lot of other thoughts. If you take rugby, for example, you've got 80 odd minutes of bashing hell out of each other. And then yeah. you've got the handshake at the end, which would be a little bit odd in, a, in, in our sport. Yeah. It's very non physical against each other, mm. and it's very physical internally. Um, but I did, I mean, I always had, I think, good relationships either with the people I raced against or um, in that, yeah, you kind of knew what they'd been through. It still made it quite sweet to win. I mean, yeah. I, I, as part of my motto is, yeah, rowing should be fun, but it is more fun when you win. Yeah. yeah. There's always that mutual respect with, with other athletes, definitely. Like, you all know, you all know what you've been through. Um, I remember one time, even more, more so than any other time when I did the Hands Cup race, which oh, yeah. was like this 12 kilometer race. Um, invitational, so be the Germans, the Canadians, the Americans, the Polish, and the Brits, and uh, everything's down at the finish line. So you all get on a bus together to to drive up to the start, and know what like it was. It was like going to war together. Like we all knew this horrific event was coming, and everyone was sort of joking and laughing together. There was no one like staying in their team and like not talking to anyone. It was it quite it was quite a strange feeling. Like all oh, that this pain of this event is bigger than anything that any of us are sort of going to do to each other here so that's a funny one it is odd Ash, I, I never did the Hansa Cup in the Jürgen came up to him once against him you don't want to do it <laughs> <laughs> I was like okay <laughs> oh, free pass yeah I did it the, I've done it twice actually the first time I did it I was like never 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 again and then somehow I find myself with the start of again. <laughs> the next year. I think that's rowing in general, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, everyone's going to do it. Always a lesson. <laughs> uh, cool. So then sort of moving on, obviously double gold at Junior Worlds um, and then straight into the senior team. At that point, there wasn't really a team, like you said, but yeah. just straight into presumably from school, university. Did you yeah. get straight there? Well, I didn't actually. I, I took a, actually ended up taking a couple of years off after school mm -hmm. um, before going to university because... Actually, I wanted to row, yeah. and there was no lottery funding in those days. So we used to get some money from um, Sports Aid Foundation that was basically about £400 a year. Okay, um, no, that's really some. Which um, often would have to be spent on a form of equipment. Yeah. Um, so actually, I I got a couple of part-time jobs. I was a fish filleter. And uh, no, it was my first job just to earn some money because the hours were horribly antisocial. Yeah. But that gave me the day to train. Yeah. Um, I then worked at British Telecom and used to service laser printers to also earn money because that was, again, either really late at night or really early in the morning. 
leaving me daylight hours to train. And so that's how I sort of transitioned. So still based in Bedford. Mm-hmm. There was a group of us up there, Pete Mulcairins, Johnny Singfield, who were also in the national team coming out of Bedford. So we either trade in Bedford or even, and it again shows about the amateurism, about six times a week, we'd drive down to London to row to, because most of the team were down in London mm-hmm. and also idiosyncratically all three of us who were based in Bedford all rode on bow sides so I couldn't necessarily all rode together um, albeit actually we all took turns to swap over yeah. and again advocate that people should be able to row both sides because it it does give you other options yeah. but my preferred side was always bow side um, but yeah so we were travelling down to London and the, the, the national team was in its entity was pretty non-existent. You yeah, not only had to fund yourself, you had to pay your way to go to regattas. So every regatta you went to, you had to pay for, um, whether that was travel accommodation or to get your boat there. Um, but actually, there were what was really nice, and not only the group in Bedford did I benefit from, but there was this group of, of recent juniors that were coming through and were talking about not just myself and Matthew, talking about Johnny Searle, Greg Searle, Jim Walker, Johnny Stingfield, Johnny Hulls, a lot of us who were 18, 19, 20 years old mm. were kind of knocking at the door. The senior team in those days, um, or they'd just come back from the Seoul Olympics, a lot of them had come forth. Mm. And I think we felt, maybe even with that underdog, kind of bloody-minded spirit, thought, well, we're better than them. Like, actually, we can we can get in. So we would turn up at regattas and try and race the establishment, and sometimes it'd win, sometimes it wouldn't. But Give them a run for their money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and ultimately, it meant that yeah, come the end of the season, when they put the eight together, it was made up of 19, 20, and 21-year-olds who had rode probably together as juniors, or a lot of us, either I drove with you, you drove with him, he drove with me, kind of. Um, and actually, yeah, I was the hour of an eight that yeah, sat on a senior world championships for the first time. Our coach was Marty Aitken, who, who again went on to coach sort of in Switzerland and elsewhere. But he told us, you know, I know you guys have been pretty good juniors, but um, everyone at the Senior World Championships, they go off so hard that you won't even believe it. So our racing start was, I think, get up to length, put in the 10 biggest ones you've ever done, and then put another 10 big ones in. Kind of. <laughs> and anyway... Long story short, we in the heat, we absolutely flew off the blocks, had a length on everybody within 250 metres, and then blew up. Oh, yeah. And completely blew up. But by this point, had so much momentum that I think at one point we had a length of clear water on very, very good eights. But even 20 or 30 years of racing later, I've never sat in a race which I couldn't wait to be overtaken in because I was in so much pain after about a minute. And I knew I still had another five minutes of the race to go. I knew I wasn't going to win because I was in such a sort of lactate hell. Um, but I couldn't be seen to ease off until someone overtook it. <laughs> so it was like kind of straining away, straining away. Eventually these Germans did come through us, as did, I can't remember who else, but yeah. That's, a, that's another athlete mindset. It's like, I just can't give up. Like, I can't give up. Like, please, someone give me the opportunity to... And just coaching last weekend, I had an athlete. We had three races after the second one. He was absolutely binned and he'd had some medical problems as well before. So, and I went up to him and says, you know, like, are you all right? Are you fine to do this one? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I was like, oh, no, he's not fine. And we had a word and we had found a sub. So then I went up to him and said, I'm going to sub you out. And he was like, yeah, all right. And I was like, he couldn't tell me yeah. that he didn't want to do it. But given the opportunity, he was, I mean, knew uh, he shouldn't. That's how you- it was a horrible feeling because we completely misjudged it. Like, I mean, there's many, many years. Actually, about some of the time, there was a good race between Steve Redgrave and Bjorn L. Tang at Henley. I don't know if you've heard this story, but no, go. it's in the diamonds. So Steve Redgrave wants to be the single sculler. This is 1986. Steve's wanting to be the heavyweight single sculler at the, uh, the World Championships. Um, he's obviously a good athlete already. He's already won gold in the Cox Four. But single is the vehicle he wants to, to race in. And he's in the race against Bjorn Eltag, who's a lightweight world champion at the time. And Steve decides he's going to blast off the start and absolutely hammers it off the start. And there's a, a lovely quote by Eltag 
that at the end of the island, I turned around and I saw he was three lengths up. Therefore, I knew I was going to win. <laughs> yeah. Because no one's that fast. Yeah, yeah. So that actually, he's going to pay for that. And sure enough, Steve stays ahead, stays ahead, gets pretty much to Remenham, gets to the enclosures, Eltang draws level. That's when you a real confidence. It takes time to build, but you have that confidence in your speed and you you know, actually, if, I'm, if they're beating me off the start, they're going to be in trouble. If they're that much quicker than yeah. me. And actually, to be fair, we used it in the Sydney 4. If anyone took us on off the start, yeah, it okay. cost them more than the yeah. off start. So, um, but yeah, going back to that 1989 World Championships, it was a humbling experience. And of course, Marty Aitken, I was like, yeah. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, you told us to put in twenty biggest strokes we've ever done, and that's what we did. And it's like, no, I didn't expect to go that hard, kind of. Um, which was a little bit Marty, to be fair. But um, yeah, yeah, it was again. I mean, it, it, it was lovely, and as I was lucky. There was a real group of us that were that had this bloody minded spirit of taking on the world or taking on the establishment. Um, we all had stupid hair in those days. We were like actually. I remember even as we were getting voting for our final, other teams were sort of, other teams were sort of wishing us good luck because we were a bit sort of different because one, we were a lot younger, two, yeah, we were smaller, three, actually, yeah, we all had stupid hair and what have you. Um, so I think they sort of saw us for sort of the comedy value and then when we actually went quite fast in the boat, it was like, oh, <laughs> come on, man, on us. Must not be re uh, must be reckoned with, yeah. Yeah, I love the double ten. I was uh, I was doing a start with a crew and just coaching them. And I said, "We're gonna so we go off, do our start, and then we're gonna do a wine ten, and then we're gonna do a power 10. And They're like, "Tom, that's just a 20. <laughs> You've got me. Yes. <laughs> there, there's a gap in between. Yeah. Just a very small gap <laughs> on the way forwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just need that little bit of a break to just go again, just mentally. If you can just be like, okay, I've just had two seconds up. Boom. Yeah. Reload. No, Some okay. athletes will just uh, accept everything that you tell them and it's brilliant. And then there's other ones that will question it and it's just sort of like, oh yeah, don't, oh, okay. Uh, get away with it. It is actually, I think, the one thing I had to learn with coaching, is it's a really hard ask to some, somebody to do. Like when you ask people to really front load and put themselves into that sort of painful position. Because actually, again, if you think too much about it, think that's, that's stupid actually. I should pace myself. I should get from start to finish as fast as I could. It's not about being ahead at any point except for the end so some people can do it and some people can't and I always used to give credit to like a lot of the Eastern European crews that I was racing against in those days they would always go off really fast knowing that they weren't going to make it in peak condition all the way and I thought well that's a real mental strength of how do you how do you know that how do you sort of if that happened last time because once I'd done it once I'd yeah. I don't think I could do it in quite the same extreme way again. But they used to do it every single race. And okay, sometimes racing, them, you'd let, you'd let them go because I can't match that pure speed. Mm. But I'll meet you at 1,500 metres gone. I don't even actually gradually work my way back. Um, but I think it's a real impressive kind of mentality if you can yeah, put yourself in that dark place every single time. What a way to experience your baptism into fire, into your first like senior racing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, I mean, it had a happy ending in that we ended up winning the bronze medal by four hundredths of a second. Again, it was it was a photo finish, us and the Americans. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't mind sharing. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be the one that comes fourth. And um, okay, in the end, we were we were third. Um, yeah, we celebrated like we'd won everything but yeah um it was i say really happy times because when you mentioned about the sort of crossing the line the thing i remember a lot like the crossing the line and, and, and one of the reasons i was never genuinely a single scholar was i loved sharing the emotion with my teammates and so yeah. actually i had a friend and she won actually the single skulls at the world championships once and she said it's like going to see the best film ever but on your own yeah, yeah. Whereas actually, the moment I remember, yeah, going back then and winning, going to the senior worlds for the first time, winning a medal, I had eight other people in the boat I was with who felt exactly the same as me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A really nice thing to share. I think that's a really important point is actually to, and um, we've talked about this before, to to work out what you want to get from where you are, and like 
if if a medal is is your goal then then be happy with it you don't always you know sometimes there was different levels maybe just making the a final or making a round of henley like whatever it is and like understand that like you can't always have everything every time yeah. and to like make sure you really still like take a moment to enjoy those wins oh completely and a couple of instances one i i think i forgot that in my coaching mm. because as my career went on and especially in the last few years it was about winning and yeah, winning steve or silver would have been a defeat mm. and then when i went into coaching i had forgotten that whole sort of celebrating wins and not everybody so when i went to switzerland i was talking about gold standard and winning whereas realistically actually if they could come in the top six that was a fantastic achievement um the other example i had was i did a little bit of coaching with the swimming team i was part of a coaching kind of development program and so i would get sort of sent to Loughborough or sort of actually went out to the Commonwealth Games sort of with the swimming team and they I think made a really big mistake because they went to the Olympics in 2000 and immediately came back were sort of came back after the end of the first week of the Olympics and had a national championships or um, another regatta or another or another competition to to compete in so they never had that high and low like mm -hmm. and emotionally I think yeah you've got to build for something you can't just keep it near you've got to build and probably yeah, come down whether that's deliberate or not but have that emotional bit whereas actually you can come back up again and yeah you need that polarization for sure yeah it's another one with 2k i'm sure i was guilty of it at some point it was probably a coach who taught me this but um seeing someone pull a pb and be unhappy with it yeah and uh, again as a coach just sit there and be like uh you can't do better than the best you've ever yeah. done you cannot you cannot do the best you've ever done yeah, and be unhappy with it. And I know we always want more, but let's make sure we take a second yeah. here to realise. And, and I think the Ergo being, I think, the easiest example, like Rupert, who I was doing, I rode with in that 1989, eight, and, and ended up rowing a pair with for a number of years. He fixated on getting a 2K score under six minutes. And that was, because in those days, that was the the line. But if you could get under six, that was... That was good. Yeah. And he was so fixated about getting under six that I don't think he ever did it. And in a race, in a boat, the person you could rely on to never stop would be Rupert. Like he would push and he would push and you'd, you'd want him sitting behind you. But on an ergo, he'd, he'd stop all the time. And actually, it was horrible to sort of to see it and you couldn't sort of talk him out of it. But it was because he was so fixated on a, I guess, a nominal barrier rather than just that 601 might be a pb great yeah yeah okay just build it up into this monster in your head yeah yeah i remember having the same thing for a long time uh just i kept i kept listening to sort of other people oh you just you just do like a 132 for your first 1500 and then slam the last 500 and it just kept not working and it wasn't me it just wasn't how i normally raced and it took me a really long time to be like that's not yeah that's not how i'm gonna do it like i'm better off coming into 1500 at like 30.2 or something yeah. and then and then just trying to sneak it over the line yeah. Uh, yeah it's all stuff that comes with just time isn't it racing again and yeah. again working out what's best for you things like that and and the ergo i think is actually it's interesting how the machine has changed when i was an athlete it was the devil's machine whereas when i became a coach it became a really useful training thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how this thing in adam's object can actually be quite different but you do see people psych themselves out like mm. I mean, go okay, back to athlete days. We used to like have ergo testing day, and the day before, I remember sitting up at Leander with whether it be James and Stephen Matthews. Like, which one of the others is not going to turn up tomorrow? Well, Rick Dunn was a given. Like, Rick was always ill on ergo day, um, but actually, it was like people would psych themselves definitely out. Of kind of, well, hang on. If it was a race on the water, why is that any different? Like, if I'm going to push myself a hundred percent. That's no different if it's on a machine or on a or water. One of the nice bits about the machine is it is physically essentially the same thing. So why actually make it any different? But it, it is, but you can just psych yourself out of it so much by just anticipating the pain and actually going through it twice, basically by expecting that physical pain to turn up. And you're already sort of like imagining how it's going to feel. So then you have to like go through that motion like more than once, essentially. I couldn't, I couldn't ever like bring up the same performance on an ergo that i could on the water and i think there was also something to do with this i, I think i haven't rode for long enough to like break over that barrier but i think eventually i would have got there 
yeah building that mental strength takes time and you even forget again sort of going when you coach like seeing people uh come through in that third 500 and just absolutely drop off the pace mm. and then and then have loads left at the end yeah. and be like you had it you could have held on to it but there's that scary bit in your head like, i think i might die this is really hurting i god i can't do it i need to back off and you forget that that takes years and years and years to be able to trust that you can push in the place where you feel like you're going to die and you'll still make the yeah because actually again it was something i'd probably forgotten when i went into coaching because for me that third 500 which you particularly mentioned was where you win races mm. like winners win in the third 500 to be mm. something i still repeat to to athletes that actually if you look at it at the top level the nine times out of ten the crew that's the fastest in the third 500 wins the thing because that's the tough one that's the one mm. where others will ease off or that and I do remember coaching a, a University of London crew at one point that had in a good race, and they, they, I would admit now that they actually do quite well to get that close. But anyway, they came into the last 500, a length and a bit down, came storming back and lost by a canvas. And my first point was, well, you might as well have stopped at 1500 because you're never going to come back from a length and a half down. You know too much. And they were like, Tim's a bit miserable. They didn't quite get it. But my point was, if you'd pushed in that... So, 500 you'd have put them under more pressure and you would have broken them when you did find your yeah like, um, but it's not easy to do and actually it's very easy as a coach sometimes to sit there and say oh just just push yeah when actually as the athlete you've got the, the devil on your shoulder telling yeah, yeah. <laughs> other things yeah the voice is always there somewhere um ah, awesome um i guess since it's sort of 89 90 91 those sort of senior worlds so i mean as we're sort of talking about it pressure and stuff how did you deal with um, being becoming a senior athlete? Did you struggle with nerves and things like that? Or, um, I mean, everyone does. Was but. there expectation that you were going to go to the, I think, the Barcelona, the Barcelona Olympics? Yes, there was, I think. Because we'd sort of broken in and we'd, we'd, we'd won medals. So the 91-8 won a medal. Um, and actually got quite close to like, to winning the thing. Which you, the Canada won it. What would have been... Germany second, sort of us third, it all sort of nip and tuck. And we're all young athletes. I thought, oh, okay, we will continue. We will get even better. But it didn't happen. 92, if anything, was my most disappointing year. First Olympics, so it was another level of mm, kind of expectation and kind of event. Like, But, but you must have enjoyed going into it. I did. Um, well, actually, my daughter was asking me about this the other day. It was so actually recounting the story, but had a situation. So we had an Easter trial in pairs, and I was around with Martin Cross. And actually, we got very, very close to beating Rick Raven Pinson. So we were 500th off beating them. At the, the trial, it was real sort of nip and tuck. Um, so I was probably as fit and strong as I'd ever been, um, but just missed out, fair enough. Um, you had the Searle brothers that were wanted to do a pair. So they were challenging to do the Coxes pair. Steve and Matthew were world champions in the pair. Um, and Martin and I were sort of left slightly without a vehicle to race in. Because um, ultimately the Searle brothers do Coxed pair, which was an Olympic event at the time. Steve and Matthew do Coxes. Both of them end up winning. Um, Martin and I originally put in some an eight and the eight really didn't work at all. It was some of the Again, it was this compromise of half of it was from Henley, half of it was from London. Mm -hmm. The coach was from Henley, but he'd never coached at that level. It was, it was a real sort of sense of compromise because you had these two groups that wanted to do different training programs. You had, they wanted to go on different training camps. So in the end, we were forced to go up to altitude where we didn't want to be because the Olympics was really early because Spain in... August is very hot, so Olympics have been moved to early summer. Consequently, we were up at altitude in June, so the lake is still frozen. In um, a lot of it, so you're rowing yeah. at a late on 1,300 metres of unfrozen water. <laughs> um, again, it sorts of things that I think just genuinely wouldn't happen now. You had an eight, at least half of which didn't want to be there. I had back issues. Martin sort of also had injury issues. What promised to be the best season ever actually turned out to be the worst in terms of the way things happened. Again, in terms of organization, we'd been given 
what at the time were brand new um, hatchet blades. The new design had just come out. Uh, yeah. The new shape of of spoon design. Yeah. Um, we had done some sort of semi scientific testing. Just decided they were no faster, so carried on using Macons. Turned up at the Olympics with Macons, and I even remember having the conversation with our coach. I said, "But what happens if we turn up and everyone else is using the new blades?" He goes, "No, like we've done our testing. We're pretty sure we're as fast with Macons as we were, as we would be sort of with the new style." We turn up at the Olympics. Everyone else, apart from the West Germans, are using the new style. Like us and the West Germans are using Macons. We get soundly beaten in the heat. Um, immediately, the coach comes right. We need to get the new blades. We need to row with the new blades. It's like, well, we've done no no training with yeah. the new blades. So we don't even have a set because actually the set that we did have had been sent back to the UK. So um, anyway, we. We approach concepts and they have two sets of four of the new style blades, but one of which is about five centimeters shorter than the other. So overnight they stick five centimeters on the end of a handle. And the next day we're rowing a Olympic semi-final with this set of blades that we've never used before. <laughs> so I really remember actually sitting in the boat and all they'd done was put a long screw through and say, it was a bit like revving a motorbike. I could actually rev my outside hand because the handle could rotate on the outside of my handle. It also wasn't quite straight, so it was slightly odd. Wow. And anyway, somehow we got through the semi, get to the final and become sixth. Um, lucky, I think, to come sixth, but it just typified probably the state of the national team in those days. It was, it was just the worst preparation I'd ever had, I think. And yet it was the biggest race I'd done up until that point. Yeah. And as I say, we we got to the final, which we were we were and should be proud of. But it was it was like the national team team was just a hindrance to the quality of the athletes. Like mm. there was a real feeling amongst the athletes that we were professional. It was a very amateur sport, but we were professional in the way we approached things. But everything around us, and that included the Olympic Association. There was no such thing as UK sport in those days. Mm -hmm. You just felt that you were sort of batting against a, a wall really to try and succeed and yeah it wasn't anywhere near the same level of professionalism of system um as I say yeah, rowing with an oar i never rowed with that wasn't even straight yeah yeah in an olympic final is just not something we'd ever considered to be it's still very impressive that I managed to get into the top six like obviously that's a big success i mean i think the, sh the shame was we we had some really talented athletes. What I think probably gets lost now slightly in the the system is how much support athletes actually do get. Because to get to the Olympics, one you had to pay your way there. It was about fifteen hundred quid to go to you paid to go to Barcelona. Um, you had to have got yourself there. You, like I was still doing my fish filleting and sort of working at BT to to cover costs, so I could train. I was having to drive from Bedford down to London or whatever for training sessions. It was very, very different. I mean, I, it does again make me sound horribly old and ancient, but I think it's easy to forget how, and, it, and it's not easier, but how different it is now. Mm. I think in terms of what we now consider to be important, but it's like, I mean, we were even like, so to do this summer, so I would drive from Bedford to Hammersmith to be off the water by eight o'clock. So that then we could get back up to Bedford, so Pete could go to work. Yeah, and, yeah. Think, and then sometimes you find yourself doing it again the next evening, all the same. And you think, well, it's crazy. Um, uh, but like, not like you said, not without its own challenges on either side. And if if anything, ho you know, hopefully you see like the, the professionalism of the British system. Hopefully, was sort of built out of those issues. And you know, like, if you could say one thing is that we have got to that serious part. But again, speaking to Alex, like. A bigger problem now is life after rowing, after having been in one institution, because you didn't have a job. You didn't. Yes. Not not that it was not easy, but they, you, these guys are doing nothing else yeah. for ten years. But perversely, yeah, I'd also look at it as a benefit. That yeah, like actually, I I ultimately went to university in order to carry on rowing, like, yeah. because at that point, you 
got a student grant, mm. so you could you could push the real world away by being a student. So yeah, I, I could go to university. The government would pay. Mm. Uh, they would also pay for my accommodation, and I could row as well. Yeah. Um, and consequently, I'd got some work experience. I'd got some qualifications. I'd also learned that that rowing life balance. Yeah, I think from the times where you had to, because yeah. that was the way it was. And so when it when it came to sort of well, what next? I was much better prepared than I think some of the athletes that have only ever rowed because it, it's there for them. So yeah, I I wouldn't go back and make it exactly the same, but yeah. um, there were definitely the elements there that 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 helped with that because yeah, all of us probably rowing, especially the group I was with, were coming through the university system. So we were at the University of London, or we were at University of Oxford or Cambridge, or um, sort of other places. So actually that helped us to kind of carry on yeah. rowing it, it it was a an imperfect but still yeah we didn't go that slowly yeah i mean that's also probably sort of a mark of a a mark of a champion in some respect is that um you can do it when it's not perfect you can you can overcome some of these things and no one's ever going to have a, like you said a perfect race yeah. no one's ever going to have everything go perfectly well so coming into those things and realizing that that's okay right what do we do next what do we do next As, and i think sometimes we we forget that People you race against have probably got the same missions. Like, okay, I mentioned the East Germans, they were full time and but different, but they had other life challenges. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's easy to think that we have it so hard. Yeah. And or oh, the Italians have it easy, or the yeah, the yeah. Americans, this, that, the other. Actually, the more I got to know them, you realize how common it was. Because actually, again, and it, it come back a few years, but then it was a, a very good crop of Australians at the years I was coming through, there were the Australian Orson Forsen was coming through. Yeah. And back in 1990, we'd gone out to Australia effectively to race them, but stayed in their houses. So I got to know their parents or I got to kind of stay in their brother's rooms or whatever. Um, and actually again, once you got to know them, you realized, yeah, they had the same issues yeah. uh, and, and challenges. It's not, it's not just unique to GB. That's an important one to remember. I mean, uh, the way Jürgen phrased it a couple of times was, we're, we're all men we all boil in water which i was like it's, get what you mean it, i'm sure we would all boil in water you know, <laughs> the point being, you know we all bleed red or there's certain yeah. different ways to say it but yeah it's uh you can get stuck in that sort of mentality of feeling lesser in some respect or feeling like you don't have what anyone else has got and yeah it's easy to forget that other people if you're nervous they'll be nervous yeah. if your legs hurt their legs will hurt yeah. things like that yeah. yeah so so then after obviously uh, how it went in 92 you were like right um we're having another go at this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I, I took a quite a long break after Barcelona, um, but always with the intention of coming back. Um, I had some serious back issues, which kind of put me behind where I'd want to be. So is that sort of where we're back, 92? So I'd had some injuries, some back injuries in 92, um, but then came to a sort of crunch in 93. Um, basically, at the age of... 23 i had to have a disc removed from my back which wasn't kind of <laughs> what i'd ideally do i mean and also and then to give good credit to to matt salard who was the surgeon no one had ever had that operation and come back to rowing at that point wow so it was a big decision to make like i had a prolapse disc um the the sort of the common science in those days was that you would fuse them, you would fuse yeah. a spray together, um, which I didn't have. I've effectively got scar tissue between vertebrae. Um, but yeah, it was, if I was to talk about low, and okay, it unfortunately repeats six years later, but that was a real low because it was ambition, challenge, top of the world, and one, I can't walk. I heard some, you literally were like lying down for a significant, how yeah. long you could do nothing. So I, I think I literally lay as still as I possibly could for over two months wow. and just had to basically, I, I went back to my mum and dad's house again, it comes back to support because yeah. I was a sort of single man student living in student, I couldn't go to college. So, um, so I basically, I went home, had the operation in Harpenden, parents lived still in Bedford never forget like i think i was in hospital about two weeks then taken back to mum and dad's house and they'd converted their living room 
sofa into a place where I could lie still, where yeah, I got fed, I got looked after. Um, after about two months, I could put one foot in front of the other, like pigeon steps. And and actually, I was lucky. There was a guy, Damien Rimmer, who was a good friend of mine at the time. He had the operation. Possibly he didn't come back to rowing. But after sort of about three months, I thought, I'm getting better and better. I'm up on my feet. I'm walking. And I remember speaking to Damien and his son. Um, have your shooting pain started yet? And I'm like, yeah, like it's all gone wrong. It's like, I've got the most incredible. He said, oh, don't worry. They last three weeks. Kind of. But it, the problem was that actually, because you've had to go through nerves to, to get to it in terms of operation. And now I was actually moving more. Mm. I was actually now sort of highlighting the fact that the nerves are also having to um, to heal. Um, so yeah, Dan's like, oh, don't worry, they, they last three weeks. They're, they're not much fun, but they're, they're, they'll go. Wow. But it was things like that. And, and again, because it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a nice operation, it wasn't a common operation to go through at the time. But I always had the determination to carry on. I think probably one of the strengths I had was that bloody mindedness of right, okay, this is something I'm doing in order to to get back to to winning something again. Um so yeah, it was it was the months of lying still. It was then getting up to doing normal things. It was then trying to get myself fit. So I used to have a an inflatable Belt. So there was a swimming pool not far from where my parents lived, and there was a uh, there was a if I was too tall to go in the main pool, there was a, a diving pool which I could use when no one was diving, and effectively practice jogging but never touching the ground, kind of in in the water. So I was doing that for a few weeks. Could eventually get onto a bike. <laughs> well, for the for the geeks who broke their bike, was it L four L five or L five S one? So that one was. L five S one, yeah, on top of the lumbar spine. Yeah, yeah that's it. Brain is about two discs. You know, I have L three four done later. But, uh, um, would you attribute that at all to the change of uh, obviously changeover from Macons? Because obviously, there's uh, in many countries juniors aren't allowed to use um, the axe shaped blades. They still have to use Macons, and that's because there's not that much strain on the on the lower back. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a number of factors. There was definitely the more directness of the new spoon shape. Like, if I was to talk about the difference of the Macons and the new shape, the the grip on the new ones was definitely more immediate than the Macon. The Macon, you'd sort of slip in slightly, and therefore, it'd been like slipping the clutch in a car, kind of, um, and maybe you'd get the return later mm. in the, the, the whip, I was the right, used to call it. Um, there was increase in training volume, because actually, science was starting to come into it, more steady outings. I honestly had never rode that long because I described earlier that so actually training volume went up massively. Also, we had no idea of injury prevention because we now are starting to get more opportunity to row. Whereas the previous training program used to have one rowing session and then your, your second session of the day would be something different. So you might actually go and play football or you might mm -hmm. go and Greg Sell used to do the Jane Fonda workout, which we never quite worked out whether that was any use. <laughs> whatsoever but he'd stare at his telly of Jane Fonda jumping about and <laughs> um yeah but actually perversely it that was probably giving us some injury prevention because it was alternative movements mm -hmm. nowadays we do a lot more Pilates or core stability but in those days it was doing something different and we didn't know why but that probably got removed because we had the opportunity to row more but also technically all my coaches have ever told me would be row long so I'd probably have my arms under my armpits and back in a C shape yeah. because it was all about rowing. Well, we didn't know anything about kind of actually sort of preventing stuff. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's an incredible journey that you went through. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, after after learning how to walk again, effectively, how long did it take until you started getting back in the boat? It was, it was a gradual process. And I, and I was lucky. I mean, fitness... For me in those days, used to come back relatively quickly. And I do remember, I, mean, I probably remember the second episode better. But actually, in both times, by the time I got back into the boat, I was quite fit. And actually, I could get on the bike and sort of push myself. I also, again, going back to my own history, as much as I enjoyed having a team and other people around me, I didn't always need it. Mm. So mm -hmm. actually, if I've still got this vision of getting to there, 
and I'm on my own. And probably one of the most horrible things I'd admit about being injured is you're on your own. And yeah, I'd get on my bike and I'd go and I'd go hard and actually I'd get myself fitter and fitter. So actually by the time I did get back into the boat, it was a little bit of a readjusting in terms of feel and what have you, but actually, I mean, I'd, I'd actually, it was about in 93, I think, because again, it was, it was early days, but we used, there used to be physiological testing at the Olympic Medical Center, which was at Northwick Park. I don't think it's there anymore. But because I couldn't row, they said, oh, well, do you mind if we test you on a bike? No. Yeah, of course you could test me on a bike. I'm happy to be tested. And actually they tested me and I came towards the top of the cycling team in terms of my fitness. Okay, I'm a bit bigger than them. Um, but say, so, oh, in terms of power output, you're, you're better than they are on a bike. Kind of. That's, that's the only thing you can do, I think, when you're injured. The same for me with my back again twice at two sort of most of the seasons out and it's a dark place. You're on your own. You're very separate from the team. Um but you got it. You just got to grab something and okay, right. I can't row. What can I do? Well, I can get fitter. Like I'm allowed on the bike or I'm in the pool. I had the same issue as one point. I couldn't even cycle because it was messing with my back. Um, and there's just a small pool in Henley and there was like a six till seven in the morning. It was open session. And at that point I wasn't even swimming. I was just allowed to do the jogging, yep. the jogging in the deep end. So it's just me and 20 OAP. Mm. And I'm in there every Wrecking morning. Wrecking the hair drive. They're still going faster than you. <laughs> I'm in there every morning and, and I get to know them all. And it, but it's like, you know, I, I'm, 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 tr I'm trying to be an Olympic rower and I, I'm in the pool with the geriatrics and, and it's just very separate. You don't see as much as your coach at different times and you've just got to gotta grab something. And like I think you said, like the main thing you can grab is like, well, I'm going to come back fitter. Yeah. yeah. And it's something I'd love to be better at, even as a coach, considering actually what I went through and what I understand others have gone through. I've yet to meet a coach that can handle that perfectly than mm. like getting that balance right of how do you keep these these people essentially um motivated mm. to come me back. And and Jurgen was good and I will give him credit for that because he was like human first. Yeah. It was was one of the things that he always said to me, like when particularly when I had the injury the second time, I guess yeah, get back to being human first. Cause I actually it was easy for me to vision, right, I want to win the Olympics. He's like, well, yeah, mm. get yourself so you can tie your shoelaces, get, get so you can kind of get out of bed, get yourself so you can do whatever it is, and then we'll start to talk about this. And I mean, I hear it from a lot of athletes. I hear it from sort of a lot of people that have really struggled. And they say the injury, that loneliness, it's not all, it's, it's not easy for coaches because you've got, you've still got the boat that you're coaching. I mean, if it's rowing, you've still got, and the boat moves on and, Again, as an injured athlete, you have to realise that. It's like, okay, I don't expect, and I actually honestly don't want the boat to stop just because I'm not in it. I want yeah. them to be successful, but I've got to get myself back somewhere. That's a really, really tough one to deal with as well in your head when you're watching a boat that you've been in do really well. I mean, I, I want the best for all my friends. I, I want them to win everything, but like, God, I want to be in it. And you know part of being able to come back from an injury and get in it is the worst that boat's doing is more likely they're going to do crew changes so then yeah. you, ha you have this horrible art yeah. bit in your head like well, well I, no I want the best I'm, oh my god I want to be in it and it's a real I mean it's something you don't get as, in other sports as much because you're not as directly in competition with your own friends yeah. I mean it's jumping a few years in my career but it's the one moment in the build up to Sydney that Jürgen asked for our documentary cameras to be turned off so yeah. we're being for those that we're watching necessarily there's a documentary yeah. following us for the four years gold fever yeah <laughs> um and actually there's they have thousands of hours of footage because essentially if we were having this conversation now there'd be another camera that was filming and ultimately would be available footage to put the documentary together but there was only once that i can remember in the four years that Jurgen said oh can we turn the cameras off and it was when i'm coming back from injury so we're in 1999 and I have, in early-ish 1999, I had similar issues with my back, so I'd had sort of back in 93, um, had a prolapse disc, was sort of had shooting pains, so the, the unfortunate story. And it meant that I, I went to see Matt Stallard again, and I mean, he was again excellent. He was like, right, we can bugger about, which is kind of what you've been doing with physio. You can bugger off and never row again, or you can come back on Tuesday. It's like, I'll come back on Tuesday. <laughs> 
have another disc yeah. taken out. So Jürgen at the time was really open with me. He goes, actually, okay, we obviously respect your decision. We know what's happening. We will give you every bit of medical support that you can possibly do. And your job is to get you back to being as good an athlete as you are now. And then the place is ready for you. Like that That's your goal. Yeah. And that was what honestly kept me going for what was essentially the six months of operation, recovery, get back to normal, get back fit, get back in a boat. And part of my sort of recovery was, was originally in a single and so I ended up training and then racing a single for a bit. For the first World Cup and then the second World Cup, I rode in, actually second and third World Cups, I rode in the eights. So the eights in 99 were very talented, very good bunch of athletes that ultimately do very well, but were probably inexperienced and Jürgen wanted me to effectively sit in the middle of the boat and sort of help him what I could in terms of giving them some direction, maybe giving them benefit of years of experience. I've definitely heard others from that crew talk about, I think Ben, Ben had Davis. Yeah. Um, he did a speech and talked when they, they felt as a boat that you made, made a really yeah. big difference. I mean, actually it was, it was really nice to, I mean, one road with such fantastic athletes because what I could see, which maybe they didn't realize as much themselves was how much talent they had. Yeah. Like, like they were all that much taller than me. They were all that much fitter and stronger and, and actually had real boat moving ability. And I think the one bit I could do was give them maybe some confidence or give them, and even again, okay, going slightly off track here, but I remember racing with them at Henley and we, West, the Germans were the world champions and I think at the time undefeated. And we had lost to them by a canvas. We'd lost a canvas off the start and effectively rode just a canvas behind them all the way down the track in what was the final of the ground. And they, the rest of the athletes were quite pleased because no one had really got that close. And I sort of slightly deliberately put on a bit of a sort of sore head and said, well, in order to beat someone at some point in the race, you've got to go faster than them. At no point did we ever go faster than them. So we were never going to win. Yeah. And I remember actually it was quite well received. And so when we then raced at Lucerne, the week later, we instigated this push in the third 500 that made sure we were the fastest boat on the water at that any particular point. Whatever it took to be the fastest boat, that's what we were going to do. And actually, we broke the Germans, that, and they never beat us again. Kind of, um, yeah. but yeah, point of principle. Then the one-on-one -on -one race. At some point, you've got to go faster than them, otherwise, you're never going to win. Yeah, so much of it is about perception, and like I said, that's something you can bring to a to a, a more novice crew is to help them see things in a different way. Yeah. I remember speaking to John Collins after um, similar thing. Was it after uh, his first Olympics in Rio? He came back and they had a they had a good race and they won bronze and he was I was sat there thinking brilliant bronze and his crewmate Johnny Walton was like we could we could have fucking won that we could have won that but I didn't come here I didn't come back for another four years to do what I did last time like we need to step it on that and he said and that was a moment in his head was like oh yeah actually like I can't be happy with what I was happy with four years ago because we didn't achieve what we wanted to achieve so so it's like yeah. bouncing off each other and I it, got, it was I mean and fast forwarding slightly to the to the World Championship that year because I ended up rowing in the eight and we had a great race to be honest because there was no like the year before they as a group had promised but then ultimately got beaten in the repechage and ended up around the b final so so that was where they'd come from and then in the final in 99 we led from all way like we could we go out and we kind of lead and ultimately the americans rose through us so we're actually disappointed but proud of what we've done and actually i, I did grab the microphone um, Rodney's up just with coxing and I grabbed the microphone and was like right okay we should be proud of what we've done but let's listen to the American national anthem stand there respectfully but actually when you listen to it think about well in a year's time we want that to be the British national anthem we only want and actually I think some of them sort of remember that but um, it's sometimes yeah just changing that sort of view of and I think probably one of the things with that group I hope I helped with was was making them realise that they could win. Them mm. being the underdog is great, but actually appreciating what you can do is also part of it. Absolutely. Sometimes it just takes someone with just a bit more experience, just a bit more confidence to let others know what their true potential is. And sometimes you just have to tell them like that wasn't good enough. You can do better, and then just help them 
sort of use that fire in order to to properly like realize their full potential which it sounds like they definitely did hearing what happened there the following year obviously i mean and and and, and sort of rounding the circle of the story it was i was in the eight effectively because i was recovering and this was the, the time that Jurgen asked for the the cameras to be turned off because the race in lucerne where actually as an eight we we do well the four wins but only just and there was a I forget who they were danish four well someone had got very close to them and Jurgen has asked for a meeting with me which is happening at the end of, um this is where yeah, he asked the cams to turn off and he's like okay considering what's happened yeah you've recovered you've proved that you're back to being the athletes that you were pre-injury boats i mean they're going quite quickly um Okay, he didn't specifically mention it, but we both knew that the four were, were going okay. Um, and he turns to me and asks me, well, what do you think I should do? And my point was, well, I'm back to being the athlete I should be. Like, I'm back to being the athlete that I was. You said that was my challenge. I've proved that that's true. I should be back in the four. And he turns to me and goes, I know, but I need you in the eight. And it was the hardest thing anyone had ever said to me in terms of kind of the goalpost suddenly shifted in terms of, well, hang on a minute. If I took this to appeal, I'd probably win. Yeah. Um, and he basically admitted that because, but I need you in the eight. And I honestly, I sat there for ages and the conclusion was actually, I can't give you an answer there. Yeah. And I'll have to go home and think about this because, I mean, in the end, there's a very happy story with the apes, but, but I didn't know that at that point. Yeah. Um, effectively, I'm giving up a World Championship gold medal because he needs me for the team. Yeah. And um, so this was running into the 99. Running into the 99 World Championship. So it's after this. Uh, yeah. And anyway, I go home and this bit is on camera because actually I, I'm sitting in my chair with the video camera on and I turn to the video camera and go, because I'm not allowed to tell anybody, Yeah. but I know the documentary is coming out months later. Yeah. So I turn to the camera and was like, well, what would you do? <laughs> um, of course, all it did was shine a red light back at me and not actually respond. <laughs> yeah. So eventually I phone a Jürgen up and say, okay, I'll go in the eight. And, um, and actually we concluded and, in the end, yeah, rowing in the eight. I was very clear, and I was actually very clear with the guys in the eight that yeah, my ambition was to be yeah. in the four, but oh, I'm mean, going to give absolutely 100% in the eight, which I, I hope I did, and I think I did. Um, I think I sort of added value to it, but what was actually quite an interesting thing was having gone to the World Championships, having got the silver, and yeah, one, we'd qualified the eight, which I think Jürgen was genuinely quite worried about, considering they'd been B final the year before. Um, when we got to the landing stage after the world's final, everyone came over to congratulate us and Jürgen came up and, and actually it's a moment again, I'll never forget of, he ignored everybody else and he came and gave me the biggest bear hug. Thank you. And it was like, okay. Yeah. Kind of that's, it was good. Like, I think, and I think the honest reason why I trusted him was like, he knew what he was asking. Yeah. He wasn't asking a small thing. He was asking a pretty big thing. But I knew he knew what it was. He he wasn't asking it by accident. He considered it, and, yeah. and actually, ultimately, I think it was a really valuable thing. I became a better rower because of it. Yeah, and it absolutely worked from them because, like you said, it gave them the the ability to think. Well, next year we're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For them, I think there was still that. And I mean, one of some very good friends in the boat, but 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 it's now. We're in an era where Britain had a real team and like the men's sweep team in those days, there was, there was ultimately Greg and Ed in the pair who, who, who could have won, but were up there challenging until the final bit. You had the eight that won and you had the four that won. It was probably the, the first time that GB was in that sort of level of dominance. Mm. And I think kind of the way things happened wouldn't ever have been designed that way, but it was, it was the time now that GB had arrived, I think, mm. in terms of a, of a world number one. Yeah, that's true because like in Atlanta Olympics, I think they only brought back one brought back one gold medal. And that was um, the yeah. team. and that's not just yeah. the rowing team. That's the entire GB Olympic team. Yeah. yeah. So uh, 
so yeah, to, just rewind a little bit, then just get to ninety six because obviously um, it's a it's a difficult one to what we know. I don't know where you placed and stuff. Mm. Obviously, you were hoping hoping for more, presumably. How did that run in? And it was it's whereas Barcelona was ultimately uh, disappointing. Mm. Atlanta, I'm still very proud, but there are the what ifs and if onlys mm. like that. That that's the shame of we came third and we lose. By not very much. Mm. We were still amateur, I guess. I mean, I was still studying. Rupert was studying. Greg and Johnny were sort of solicitor and surveyor. So, yeah, we would be doing the early morning row before everyone went off to work or to college. Um, then probably a, a session on our own in the evenings. We'd make a lot of training camps every time we we could go on training camp. We we'd really hit it hard. So it was a different routine. But we did what we could. But actually, the downside, I guess, without overemphasizing the negatives, was was while Atlanta as Olympics was a bit of a shocker in terms of organization that mm-hmm. Atlanta probably hadn't realized what the Olympics was about, whereas the London Olympics, absolutely fantastic. Sydney, amazing. Like, Olympics are and should be this all-consuming event. Atlanta probably... I think if they had the American National Championship, they'd have been happier because actually our, our heat in Atlanta, we we're in the same heat as the Americans, and actually we row off the left hand side of the telly because the camera still follows the Americans and we well, come in fourth. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like if you'd watched only the second half of that race, you'd have assumed the Americans had won it, but we've already disappeared off the <laughs> off the screen by that point. Um, and it was a shame because the people were lovely, yeah. but like buses didn't know where they were supposed to go. So at one point, I'm I'm driving one of the athlete buses to the to the rowing course because I can drive a bus and I know the way because Paul Lady who's volunteered thought she might be pointing her spectators towards the stadium but has been given a bus to drive she's yeah. never driven a bus before God. Right. Um, so it was sort of bits like that so there was that element of disorganisation in that we as a team like so the, the men's pair Stephen Matthew the men's four all moved out to the village because we couldn't rely on the transport so we actually move into a local hotel, which is close to the rowing course. Um, so that's slightly sort of distracting, I guess. But anyway, we, we race the heat, we row well, we win. We race the semi-final, we row well, we win. And we're now at the start of the Olympic final. And to regret to this day that we, we changed our tactic. We were, as a full, we're always fast finishers. We would never really get off the start fast. We... Sort of stay in the race we gradually come back and then no one could stay with us in the last 500 that was what suited us and that was what had worked up until that point but for some reason in that race we thought well and i am a fan of the third 500 but said right we're really going to go third 500 we're going to effectively sprint the third 500 get ourselves from level to a length ahead and surprise the opposition yeah and okay it sounded good but in reality on the day we got to a thousand meters a length and a half down because I think we were waiting for the third five hundred. And consequently our sprint gets us back level. And if I remember the race clearly, you've actually got all six crews crossing the fifteen hundred meters within half a second of each other. And effectively the race started again, but we've already used our sprint because we were rating forty four for the previous minutes and a half. Um and okay, we, we come third, the Australians slip out there. I, I'd love, it's one of the races I'd love to do again. I honestly believe if we'd race that race 10 times, we'd win six. But whilst the Aussies have won the first one, they don't offer you a best of three. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's the, that's the shame of that to me. Despite the injury, despite the kind of amateurish things we had to cope with, I think we could still have won that. I still think we were. We were a good crew. I think you're saying with people, non-athletes, quite often, you know, well, they got a bronze medal. You know, why are they unhappy? Why are they unhappy? And it's like, obviously, you get to look back in years later. I think because you sort of, you knew you'd won that. You knew, I think I, I would say, say that crews, you know you're at the level for podium. And it's like, actually, now it's like, what's next? Yeah. You know, what's going to come next? So I think you sort of feel like missing out on that next one without without being... Uh, I guess also like speaks to the standard of of the event and and what British Rowing was doing and the fact that your athletes can can win a medal and be like, oh, I want I mean, more. We got absolutely chastised in the press. Yeah, um, 
because actually we're there in the medal ceremony. And I, I, I raise a smile, but it's a, it's a bit of a front. Johnny, Rupert, and Greg look like they could kill someone. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And actually, the press really came down on us hard wire and us to feel they're better than yeah. Yeah. whatever uh, coming third in the world. But to me, the, the disappointment was it was ours to, it was in our hands and we didn't take it. That actually, full respect to the Australians and the French who both beat us. And we could have been Slovenia, we're only point one of a second behind us, although they were so, we could have been out the medals quite, yeah, quite easily. Um, but to me, it was, especially in, in World Championships or Olympic terms, it was the one that got away. Yeah, it was, okay, a bronze medal. I've got it at home somewhere, not quite sure where, but it's it's at home. But the shame is if I look at it, it's the what here. Yeah, yeah. So if you had one goal then that at those Olympics, would you have continued? It's a really good question. Because undeniably, it's what fired me for the next four years. Yeah. That actually even, fast forward four years, the night before the Sydney final, we all, four of us, sit around a table and for the first time really talk about why. Like why we've talked a lot about the what we're going to do how we're going to do it but actually to be honest he talks about why Steve for the first time internally talks about winning fifth Olympic gold medal whereas he probably only ever talked about winning the medal he'd not won yet yeah like so he would talk about winning but for the first time that evening he talked about achieving five Olympic gold medals which was obviously completely unique Matthew talked about being a legend not just being a winner but being the best of the best and actually I always I said well I, my history is I sat not exactly here but I, I sat in a room four years ago in the same event with the same opportunity and didn't take it mm. that actually I've spent four years to get back to the same position the thing I can now do in the next 24 hours is get it right yeah James just burst into tears which actually told you everything I mean in terms of emotion and I keep don't think you get any words out but it was like yeah, kind of. I mean, actually, to be fair, the longer story was James not only couldn't say anything, he went downstairs in the Olympic Village where there was a TV room and um, turned on the telly and we had the British feed so you could watch some British telly despite the fact we were in Australia. What's late night the night before for us is early morning or final. Turns the telly on and there's Steve Ryder, who was the host of BBC Sport, goes, only 14 hours to go until the Costas Falls final. At which point James can't sleep a minute for the whole night. <laughs> I spoke a little bit. It's quite funny. In two, 2010, I did enter through Ben Lewis as my coach, mm. and he'd sort of forgotten about that. But um, I remember that that was the uh, same thing the night before. We have to sit down. We've done really well. The time's looking good. Like, could be on here. And I never, ever felt more nervous than sat down talking about winning a gold medal. And it, mm. it was, for me, it was the bit I struggled with the most. And, like, it's just... So you don't do that. You yeah. don't sit down yeah. and do that. You go rowing a lot, get on the water, do my thing, stretch all that. But like, I never sit here and talk about it. And eventually we didn't. We got a medal. It's good. But we all think about it, but it's rare that you get to say it out loud, especially with your entire crew. Yeah. And presumably that was a, a Jürgen who had made sure that you guys were going to do that. Yeah. I mean, for us, and this is one of the things that Jürgen brought. And, and it was interesting because after Atlanta, up until Atlanta, I'd never really been coached by Jürgen. He was, by this point, chief coach, albeit the four that I was in was slightly separate. We were still training in London. Mm -hmm. like I was still on the Tideway, and actually, as a four, we'd we'd row out of Molesley. Um, but after that, well, I suppose originally I came to Oxford. I, I studied again for a year, and rode in Oxford, albeit after Easter, I, I then rode out of Henley, mm -hmm. where the others were, and we put the four together. But one of the things Jürgen was very different about compared to other coaches I'd had because he had his gold standards. Like we'd sort of had time and gold standards previously, but he was like, right, we're going to win. And in order to win, like, because oh, well, we're going to aim to win. And in order to win, yeah, you need to do this speed. In order to do this speed, you need to do that on the ergo. You need to do that in the gym. You need to do this X, Y, Z. And actually the whole parameters thing was a very, very different philosophy I guess to, to what I'd had before so for him he'd really reduced that x factor of okay well what, what does a winning crew take well I don't know but it's a bit of magic yeah, yeah, yeah. Jürgen would have okay you've got all these components you still need 
and ultimately one of the things I think he was different to some of the other East German coaches because a lot of I mean, East Germany had, had all this fantastic success in the 80s and 90s but very few of their coaches made the transition out because I think for them it was all about science for us in Britain at the time it was all about magic kind of <laughs> Jürgen brought science and admitted there was an element that he couldn't quite control but actually you tried to make that as small as possible so having that sort of cascade of parameters was quite a different philosophy for me and yeah he was telling me right again yeah, we know you you're technically quite good we know you love racing we know you've got this but you need to be stronger like and you need to be stronger at this or you need to be better at that and that's not going to make you any worse at this but if we can raise that ultimately you'll you'll be better and and i bought into it i was probably at the stage of my career where I needed to have something different as well. I'd been going for a while sort of with an old regime on my own philosophy, but actually, I, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of respect for Jürgen at this point. Um, and also what I had respect for was was the people I was rowing with. I mean, it was some fantastic rowers, but it wasn't that I didn't get a say. Like, when the early days of when we're putting the four together, I felt I had as much input as anybody because I'd, I'd rowed the event for... Mm six years previous kind of um so i was the only one who probably rode the event before kind of where was up the Stephen matthew had had a very successful pair before we had been very successful coach james yeah brought his qualities and motivation and kind of everything that that james is fantastic at so in our sort of forming stage it was a collective effort rather than jürgen just dictating mm, this is what we're going to do or Stephen matthew saying this is the way we've always done it. Now we've won. Or me saying, hang on, though, you row a four like this. That was quite a nice sort of open forum, I guess. Yeah, I like that. I've sort of done that way. I've heard some people speak about, oh, you know, you know, don't don't ask your athletes how it's going. You know, just tell them how it's going. You're like, well, it depends on the quality of the athlete and the crew. Yeah. Uh, and it says experience that you can't be ignored. I honestly think, and whether Jürgen didn't feel as comfortable, but the person who probably spoke the most in the training sessions was me. Like, because I liked to do it. I've done it previously. Like, bizarrely, despite the fact I was in the stroke seat for the four in in Atlanta, you had two brothers. Rupert had been at school with Johnny and so had known him and they wound each other up like, there's no tomorrow. Come mm-hmm. on, they both knew exactly which buttons. So none of them were allowed to say any technical calls because if I took, if I, if Rupert said sharper catches, Johnny would think it was a personal slight on his catch. So John, Rupert wasn't allowed to say that. Greg wasn't allowed to talk about finishes because Rupert might think that was a pass. So you've got this stupid situation where I'm at stroke and I'm having to turn around and give all the technical clues as well as any goes or what have you. Um, but actually, I quite enjoy it. And actually, I felt it was probably one of the strengths I have of the boat is I might not be able to see what you're doing, but I can feel it. So, okay, I can, can make that comment. And that translated into the Sydney Four. And whether Jürgen was happy to give me that role because he didn't feel he wanted it or because he knew I wanted it, I'm not quite sure. But actually, I would do a lot of the, the quality control of the, like, within training sessions. Jürgen would be on the bike. I mean, he would say things, but not a lot. It would be me sort of, yeah, giving the commentary, I guess. Not in races. Steve would give it in races, but actually in training. It was part I enjoyed, and I think... It showed, I guess, in some ways, the confidence Jürgen had as a coach that he didn't have to control absolutely everything. And he, like, so even in terms of the way the boat was rigged, like I had suggestions, like actually, I don't think we need four degrees. Actually, I think we only need three. Um, okay, let's try it. Seems to work. Okay, that's what we carried on with. Just sort of silly things like that that I think helped empower me. Whether ultimately, I think he, he had the right of veto. I'm pretty sure and yeah. use it when he needed to. Yeah, but it, he definitely knew he was coaching men that he could trust and rely on. So it's different. Obviously, like you all in that crew have done many, many, you know, cycles of world championships and like been to the Olympics, won medals there previously. So it must be it must be different. I think thinking back to many different crews, um where the voice comes out, I don't think you choose. I think he sort of chooses you that mm. position. Um it depends, you know, on your you know, your se- seniority and in terms of the crew and things like that. Like you said, whether you have feuds with anyone else in the crew, whether you're good at coming across 
you know, quite often when when the pressure's on in pieces and stuff, some people can get a bit aggressive in the way they call. If you're more able to do that, bet people management. There's like certain people that just kind of fill that role a bit better. Um, and like you say, Jürgen was always a, a bit on the numbers. And it was credit to the, the guys in the back. Because say the, the differences of the two fours, the Atlanta four or the Sydney four. Like the example, pre what must have been 1994 World Championships, four with Johnny Gregg and Rupert. We've gone out to America where in, we're testing out a venue that we might use pre-Atlanta. So it's, it's down in Georgia. It's supposedly a lake that's got alligators in it. It's huge and it turns out to be far too big to row on because one breath of wind mm. meant it has got too rough. But we're doing our pretty much final pieces before like transferring up to the World Champs venue two days later. And I'm at stroke. I'm thinking kind of, some conversations happening behind me. And anyway, it turns out well, we, we, we were going to, we we're going to do a piece. And it was part of our thing was to sprint the last 30 seconds. We always practice sprinting the last 30 seconds. It's kind of our thing, but it had been agreed that we wouldn't sprint because actually these were step rate pieces and the world championships are only three days away. And we'd save our energy, whatever. Anyway, gets to 30 seconds in and Johnny starts to sprint. So Greg, who's in front of starts to sprint and I start to sprint. Rupert stays at 26 and ultimately the boat goes snooze around at 45 degrees. Rupert's hitting Johnny in the back. Johnny says something to Rupert. All I hear is I've had this shit for 15 years. Look at this. And literally the bow pair are having a fight in the middle of the boat where 1500 meters from the bank in supposedly this alligator infested lake. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I'm Greg tries to hold Johnny's arms, which means Rupert gets a free hit. So Greg <laughs> thinks, oh, I'd better let go here, kind of. But Steve Gunn, because the other dynamic he had, but Steve Gunn was coaching us, who'd been the teacher of all the other three. Because like, Steve had been a teacher at Hampton, all three had gone to Hampton. And he, Steve, went absolutely ballistic, so much so that I felt incredibly guilty. I'm thinking, well, I'm... anyway, we row, so Greg and I row the boat back. The other two were sitting there fuming. The physios and the whole team have obviously heard this despite the fact we're 1500 meters away and like help us with the pump and get the blades in but okay five minutes later they're best of buddies like actually <laughs> kind of sorry sorry it was dumb it would be but it was a very different dynamic it can be comparing that sort of almost sort of need to have explosive moments like maybe sort of feel that things would build you had to have and this was the release of and then it meant that things were were good in the Sydney four it was a much more kind of well I don't know Ben's used the phrase but uh, will it make the boat go faster mm. if it's a conversation that could make us go faster it's a conversation we can have and we can have a convers we can have a discussion and I might bring up a topic and ultimately we might decide not to do it and I'll have to accept that mm. or otherwise yeah when I do some stuff say I guess businesses now I don't think they, the businesses always have that ability to be open and honest and, and have the conversations that could be seen as kind of conflict. Yeah, I think it's something as, as, as the Brits, we're maybe not quite good at. Mm -hmm. um, we dance around the subject yep. quite often. We'll use different words. We won't specifically say it. It's something I've learned from my wife who's Czech. Mm -hmm. They don't. Yeah. They If they have something to say, they say it. And initially, because you're used to people dancing around oh i think maybe we could do this in the boat a little bit better or you know there's one blade going in late but you just say everyone could get a bit earlier you know rather than say it's yeah. seven seat mm. um it initially can seem argumentative yeah. confrontational but actually when you understand no everyone here wants this boat to go faster so anything that's being said is for yeah. the benefit of the crew and oh actually now like i am getting told it's me yeah. so i can make a change and you look for any athletes I've rode with, the ones who can accept it as much as you don't want to, as much as you never want to be singled out. And the coach says, you're messing up. If you can accept that and get on yeah. with it and make the change, you're going to get faster. The example, I guess, I've had with the Sydney team was, as a, as a team, our ambition was to win every single race, like to win every heat, semi-final, whether it's a World Cup, whether it's Henley, whether it's, Kingston sprint, if we'd ever, but we would aim to win. Like, albeit you wouldn't always prepare 
like ultimately we're always aiming for the Olympics, but any time you sat on the start line, you aim to win. No matter what, like winning is a habit. Yeah. I also want the others to feel they can't win. And yeah. we were pretty successful at that in that as a four together, we won every single race. And I can't even remember us ever being led at any point in any particular race. Like we, we had a fast start, we lead, we do what's necessary, cross the line first. Semi-final next day, we do the same. We do the same. So every World Cup, World Championships, yeah, Henley race that we raced in, we always led until the very final one before Sydney. So what well, was World Cup final in this um, six weeks, seven weeks before Olympics, we sit on the start line, race to race, and we don't lose, we get absolutely thrashed, like by eight seconds to the Italians. And the whole story, I guess, would be, we could have ignored it, like there was whatever, however, races we've had, 44 wins out of 45 races is not a bad ratio. So, And there were certain reasons why that might have been an exception. Like the race had been delayed by about two hours because the weather it was snowing in Lucerne in July. So uh, <laughs> the weather was appalling, which is why they'd delayed the race. A two-hour race delay for me is an inconvenience. Steve has diabetes. A two-hour race delay for a diabetic is a pretty major yeah sort of thing to have to to deal with so without blaming steve you could maybe i suggest that he probably wasn't on top four and you could put that down as a uncontrollable never happen again and ignore it we could have changed everything but ultimately what it made us do was have this conversation that we just described this really open honest conversation where initially jürgen tried to take the blame and say it's his fault because we'd we'd raced both the first two World Cups, we trained hard, we'd raced Henley, and then we'd gone to Lucerne, and Jürgen's point was he had overtrained us and ill-prepared us for this, and we would. And so he, had said he he promised us that he'd get us right for the Olympics, which was not wrong, but it was, in my opinion, not the whole mm, answer, because I sort of effectively stood up and said, well, hang on, my job's the quality control, and I've now seen the race on telly. And it looked very different to what I was feeling. Therefore, I'm not doing my job very well. Um, and yeah, okay, we need to make sure, or I will make sure we are on top of things and really as attentive as, as we should be. And I think we all took responsibility. Like James talked about being distracted away from the boat, um, which is very unlike him. Normally, he was very, very focused and yet yeah, had, had other things going on in his life. But the meeting didn't stop there. There was... Well, I remember, not an easy thing to say, but I had to basically say two of my teammates were overweight. So that actually, size, physical mass is a big advantage, but perhaps it'd be very unprofessional to say it was Stephen Matthew, but um, <laughs> that actually they'd got too big. And the discussion, if I remember it rightly, what we had was, well, hang on, if I lose weight, will I lose power? Mm. Okay, we can have that. So, and it was a very open, honest but effectively, I'm telling our only two Olympic champions that they're overweight. Um, it's not because I don't like the look of Matthew's bottom in Lycra. It's because actually, if we as a team lose some weight, the boat will sit a bit higher. Absolutely. We'll go a bit faster. Yeah. Um, and actually, to be, give them complete credit, I don't think it was ever considered to be personal. It was just about making the boat go faster. Yeah, and if you want to achieve greatness, you have to be able to have those difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's great advice for any crew at any stage, at any level, mm -hmm. to be able to sit down and honestly say, this is how I feel. And it depends on your, I think if you're in your first two years of rowing and you're rowing with guys who are much more, obviously you're going to have yeah. less to say, yeah. but at a certain point. But also I think because the culture was that we could do that, it wasn't an out of the blue mm. meeting that we, we suddenly had because we'd lost. It was a meeting that we thought we'd been having actually after every race, even part of the thing we thought was like, even if we win, we want to be critical in a positive and negative way. Like, mm. actually, okay. So we had that environment where we were willing to be challenging. Mm. So this was the most challenging, but it wasn't like it was completely out of context. So, yeah. uh, and I'm not one that deliberately argues, I'm not a deliberately sort of argumentative person, but. It was about, yeah, well, hang on, if we said we're going to do it, then what do we have to do? Let's look in the mirror, yeah. If we said A, B has to follow. Yeah. So I guess we have to ask, how was that um, final? Obviously, like, um, 
le- the weeks leading up to it, like you coming back from injury, being selected back for the four. How did it like all play out? And I guess, what did you feel when you crossed the line? Um, I'll tell the short story first for the long story. I mean, people say sometimes that it doesn't sink in or, or I guess you build it up to be pretty big. Like I was always a bit of a dreamer and would use the crossing the line, the, the medal or the anthem or whatever to sort of inspire me through the dark moments. So I built it up to be a pretty huge thing. And then when it actually happened, I'll be honest, it was worth about a hundred times more than I ever thought it was going to be. I mean, it was the most amazing, not just a moment. I mean, the fact that I can sit here now, what are we, 23 23 years later, and still get the tingles shows how much it actually, actually meant. Because it was the journey and actually rewinding back from the injury and the operation I'd had in 99, the coming back, the selection, like the pairs trial, I remember being a really key moment because that ultimately, like so James and me ended up winning the pairs trial. Um, and that sort of, that was the final bit. And that, that like, because even despite the fact I was going well in all the, the, the tests, it's like, okay, okay. But actually, James and I won that, actually won it quite, quite nicely with actually what was Greg and Ed second and Stephen Matthew came third. Um, that was the final bit. So that was a nice moment. Um, but then the, so the racing and then ultimately getting to Sydney and, and realizing this was it, like without actually admitting it, I knew it was my last chance. Like, oh, I would have never have thought of it at the time. And if I hadn't won in Sydney, would I have tried to carry on? Yes, I would. But physically I was probably up against it and sort of whether it was injuries or age, um, but I felt ready that actually, whereas the advantage, whereas the the slight shame of Atlanta is, I look at the what ifs or if only. I can honestly say, if I was sitting at the start line at Sydney, it was me. Like hundred percent of me was there. Like what well, I didn't really think within any noticeable amount that there was more I could have done or other things that I would have done differently, which actually meant I probably wasn't as nervous as I. I almost overplayed the confidence um, having gone down to the course. So the, the race is at 10.30, or the race was at 10.30 in the morning. Um, so we've gone down, we've done our pre-paddle, much the same as any other boat might do. Um, we've got into a tent to, to get some quiet time. Matthew's got his book, James has got his headphones on. I actually fall asleep, which I knew I shouldn't do, but because I'd, I'd sort of worked on having some calming techniques i think i overcalled myself and then lacky ultimately gives me this nudge because i'm just like a, sorry of course so i start to think about winning start to think about race start to get myself kind of going again which didn't take long to be fair um but yeah there's that sort of quiet moment that you all have then the other race because ours is the last race of the day which again i think was was quite deliberate because it wasn't just in britain that stage fifth was uh, um you know the Coxus Fall was held by the Australians at the time. So they were reigning Olympic champions. There was all the story of Steve aiming for his fifth. So it was like the final race on the Saturday. Um, there were huge crowds there. There was incredible telly. But yeah, we got that quiet moment. Yeah, we got ourselves onto the start. But even on the start, I remember thinking, well, this is it. But I am as ready as I could be. I still think, I mean, back in the old days, you used to have to line your boats up and get them straight and get them level. Nowadays, obviously, the bucket comes up, but they've still not changed the rules as far as I know that you still have to be on the start two minutes before. And that is the longest two minutes of your life because you literally have nothing to do. I think I don't know, turned around to Steve and said something really inspirational like, have a good one. <laughs> what else do you say? It's like, um, and then you sort of sit there for a bit more, you make sure your gait is tight, you check your feet for the umpteenth time. Yeah. Um, but for me, and again, maybe what was really quite different between Sydney and Atlanta was that confidence. And I honestly had the confidence to say, well, if we row the way we can row, we will win. That actually I've got three 
big, strong, fantastic athletes with me. My job is to make sure they can do what they can do um, in terms of length, in terms of rhythm, in terms of movement, in terms of platform. If I can do that, then we will win. Like the, yeah, whether it's the Italians, whether it's the New Zealanders, whether it's the Australians at all, who had all beaten us in Lucerne. By that point, again, I was confident that, yeah, we'd done, we'd done what we needed to do. And the race itself? It wasn't our best row. Um, I mean, we always led off the start. Our tactics were very overly simple get up, stay up. Yeah. Like, we were very explosive crew, and actually, I think we still hold the 250 meter record for falls in terms of like, basically, I just had my seatbelt on and I let, I let big boys <laughs> do the rest. But in terms of, I mean, if you Steve, in terms of explosive power, was another level, like kind of, and like, because we were faster than the eight over 250 meters. So, yeah, we could fly 250. Um, and so, actually, part of our attack was use it, get off the yeah. start, get ahead, which we did. My, if I sort of think about my role on the one minute, we would effectively keep it. We had sort of a couple of, not strides, but a couple of steps. But then on the minute, it was like, like really out long and a row. And that was where I thought, well, that's, that's now coming into my territory. Like I need to make sure those in front and behind me are, are long. And I do remember, and that was good. I thought, oh, that's nice. We're in the rhythm now. Right, we're going to inch away here. And we did, but maybe not as much as I thought. The Italians had always, at a thousand meters, they'd put in a push. Yeah. They always had a sort of 10, 15 strokes where they'd lift the rate and you had to be prepared for it. But then they'd always and had to come down. Yeah. But in this race, they didn't come down. They sort of having been whatever half, two thirds of a length down on us, put their push in. And rather than coming down below 42, they went up to 43 and they went up to 44. And we're coming closer and closer. Um, yeah, I mean, the way it was, it's effectively very quiet, apart from the, the, the pure rowing noises. But then the crowd started just before the 500 to go, and there were crowds on both sides. I think that's about 35,000 people in on the day. That's a lot. Um, and actually a, a really impressive crowd, because actually part of our tactic was what happens if uh -huh. we reach the crowd because you've got predominantly the Australian crowd yeah. who want the Aussies to win, who um, kind of maybe expects the Aussies to win because they are a bit different crew, but reigning Olympic champions. But the noise and the positive, it was, it's not much you can hear, but you could hear this. It was, it was proper noise. Steve was very good and very clear, monosyllabic, go, but like kind of, and then legs, 400 to go. Um, I do remember allowing myself a look and thinking, right, maintain, get this, get this, get this. We've got this, we've got this. And okay, the others are catching us. At least we can see them. James, and okay, I hear James go, the Italians are coming, the Italians are coming. Which he claims sounded so much better in his head. He was trying to, <laughs> he was trying to be inspirational on him. Yeah. Um, he did apologize afterwards. Um, but yeah, we slightly got caught up. I think if I'm being ultra critical, we, the Italians were much higher rating than us normally. Like we were a big, mm. powerful, longer strokes was our strength. They were high rating and yet we get caught up in their race a bit. So we get quite high rate, but we do enough. And okay, we crossed the line. We knew we'd won all pit, I think. It's one of the benefits you have of being involved is you can judge it a lot easier than those on the side. Yeah, even when it's really close, it can it can uh, especially like coming into the red boys and stuff. You kind of know what yeah. a bow can do. Yeah. So even though it was close in the end, yeah, you kind of know, don't and, you? And it was honestly, I mean, in terms of the people around me, I mean Matthew, whose motto was "Don't do more than you need to do." Like, I could probably. I can't remember the exact number, but I could probably quote you a hundred races where it's been close and Matthew's won every single one of them. Yeah. Like I've never known Matthew not to win a close race. Like I have seen him lose, but that's by a length or two. Yeah. But if it's close, if the big man knows what to do. And I know it was a point of contention in Atlanta that Steve reckons Matthew could have gone harder in Atlanta. 
and they could have won by more. <laughs> and I honestly think back, you could probably have gone harder and said, I think, I know in, in a fast forward four years in, in Athens, the four wins by five hundredths, which is yeah too close even for Matthew to judge. Yeah. And Matthew's in tears on the medal ceremony. And a lot of people think that the emotion of winning is false gold. I honestly think it's the only race he ever had to push himself on. <laughs> and if you push yourself, it hurts. <laughs> well, still, I mean, like that, um, the Sydney one, you know, seeing, you know, Steve just done, like, all of you done. Like sometimes, even though you give everything, you're still able to find that elation. And I think you just want five. Yeah. Like if that wasn't a point that you could bring a, bring in a, uh, you know, fist pump out, but it still wasn't there. Yeah. You're like, well, okay. No, no, that's no. everything. I mean, it was. In terms of a race, I mean, one is the emotion from crossing the line and waiting for the rest of the world to catch up. Even if it's only 0.4 of a second, that's a, a moment that you never forget. Just that beep. When that beep is to you, it's like, and so you've got that wave of achievement. You've got Stephen Matthew did say that, yeah, if you win the world championships, Blah, blah, blah. If you win the world, if you win the Olympics, the pain goes away immediately. Nah. <laughs> they were lying. <laughs> um, so you do get that 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 physical, but you've got what I describe as sort of waves of of emotion, I guess, and it's difficult to kind of know what to do. But yeah, just for me, that was. And then was going back to the the journey analogy. It was like, okay, that was the end of this journey, and okay, life changed quite a bit at that point. Um, but that was it. That moment where you do cross the line is probably the end of the first quite long chapter, 12 year chapter, 15 year chapter of rowing. Mm. Um, and yeah, yeah, I built it up to be a pretty huge thing, but immediately and repeating for 23 years, you get those, those highs, those tingles, those smiles that sense of achievement just every now and again you're just driving down the road you're like oh yeah i, I did do that <laughs> i was good i love i love to hear it i love to hear that it is that good i want it to be you want it to be um and having spoken to other people you know when they want medals and stuff to hear that it's as good as they thought it would be i'm like yeah good and the shame is you have to put the cost in first yeah and actually but then whether because you put the cost in it makes it more valuable when you achieve it but i'm a believer that it may doesn't have to be olympics it doesn't have to be sport but if you genuinely challenge yourself to do something that you are, you want to do, you're passionate, you're determined, the achievement of it is is more than you'd ever you'd ever realise. And I think absolutely, there was a really I can't really do it justice, but I was involved with a um, the Special Olympic football team. They they had their their Special Olympics fairly recently, and they had this lovely motto that was, "Please can I win? But if I can't win, please can I be brave enough to have tried?" And um, I think often we're not brave enough to have tried. Yeah. But if you do put yourself out there, challenge yourself, make yourself vulnerable, but then achieve, I think that's also a part. Yeah, I like a quote I saw the other day was, um, just because you can't, you think you won't be able to do it is not a good enough excuse for not trying. Yeah. Like, it's not, you, you can't get just to write it off because you're like, I'll never do it. Like, so what? Yeah. And without being overly critical or cynical, I do hear a lot of, oh, I could have been a contender. Mm. Mm. And without belittling anybody, everybody could be a contender. Mm. Like, it's actually the challenge is then, yeah, to make yourself vulnerable, to to put yourself out there to, yeah, if it's rowing, go through your 18,000 repetitions to, to get yourself on the start line, fit enough, technically good enough, cohesive enough or whatever. Um that actually means you could win. And that was, I guess, probably part of the, the thing I had with the Swiss when I, I went to them. I was like, if you do this, you might win. But if you don't do that, you won't. Yeah. Like, I can't promise you you're going to win. Yeah, yeah. The winning's never certain, but you put yourself in a position where it's possible. Um, but also, I agree, you know, like the, the run you had and what you went through with your back and stuff, like, it makes it all the sweeter. And not that it's not important to everyone, but someone who sort of came into the in the team, did one cycle, uh, jumps into the middle of an eight, wins a lot, goes to takes gold. Of course, it means a lot to them, but not as much as to the people. I remember again, Ben Hunt Davis saying, you know, I was in the senior national team for 10 years. I lost everything mm. for 10 years. 
I yeah. didn't win anything until I won the Olympic final. Yeah. I mean, Ben was a lovely story because, yeah, yeah, he gets the, he gets the happy ending yeah. at the end. I mean, I'd, 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 Ben was in the 1892. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I do think it is, I mean, I guess part of the thing that I hold special is, is that transition of the era almost that kind of amateur to professional mm. that kind of very much sort of self-driven and then now supports there. And that to me was, I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it was quite a different journey than, than maybe someone who comes into the team now that there is just that much more opportunity. There is that much more support. It's definitely no easier because standards have gone up. Mm. Um, but they are different challenges. And I think a lot of people and everybody, whether it's Brits or Italians, Australians, Americans, or whoever it's going to be, they've all got their, their challenges to go through. And almost coming back to the bit we said before, like sometimes we we think they have it easy. They don't. They've just, they've just got some things that we don't know about, which we don't always advertise some of the struggles because, yeah, pre-race, how are things? Yeah, good. Yeah, really good. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we're really fit. Yeah, well, you see someone uh, walking around, someone you know from the Australian team. Like, How's it moving? Oh, that's very good. It's going well. <laughs> not going to give anything to anyone. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. It's only afterwards you find out they've not been on the water piston. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, it doesn't matter what level you're at or at which stage of the sport, I guess, you're coming in, whether it's amateur or professional, there's always mountains to climb. So that's that's always like something to, to be remembered. I imagine the celebrations were huge after that. Wait. It was... Well, actually, I... I'd like to think of myself as a team player, but you've got the situation where we're all the Olympic Village is, I mean, it's a bizarre sort of Disney world of elite athletes, kind of, in that no one is average. Like you're either six foot plus or you're four foot less or you're weightlifter wide or sort of. And okay, you've got a situation where we've got a, a luxury apartment that's been built three-bedroom luxury apartment, but there's 14 of us in there. So Steve, Matthew have half of one bedroom with a subdivide, and then there's James and me in the other half of the bedroom. You've got the eight um, split up over two other bedrooms, and you've got the, I guess it must be the pair in the living room, kind of living in the living room. You've got the double sort of somewhere else. Um, so actually we finished. Well, obviously, we won, we celebrated, but that's the eighth race is tomorrow. So I thought, actually, the best thing a team player could do would be not to go back to bed that night Absolutely. and stay up all night and celebrate. <laughs> for the team. It, for the, for the team. team. It, was real, it was a real tough <laughs> ask. Um, but I thought Did the worst thing to you gave me to disturb them. Come down and said, Tim, I need you to do something for me. <laughs> I need you to go out on I think Jürgen knew me well enough that I wouldn't be the one he'd ask yeah. the, 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 the next morning in the... I don't know, I mean, I jokingly say, but you do, you you put absolutely everything in and you build up and, yeah, whether that was the end of my career, which ultimately it pretty much was, but you have to enjoy it or you have to then go the other side. And I used to have a student, I'd always give my medal to my mum to look after because I was going to go off and do something stupid. <laughs> um, and actually, for one, I wanted to share it. Yeah, like my mum and dad were there and that was... That was huge for me because they'd been massive supporters for me, whether it's through injury or early years. So they were there to share it with. There were other friends there. There were people that I didn't even know that travelled halfway across the world that suddenly were there and you were like, wow, this is incredible. There were other athletes from the British team. So the swimming team would come out to support us because actually we'd shared a training camp with them. And pretty much en masse, they'd come out to watch. So... It's difficult to put in just a, that atmosphere. The Aussie crowds that I guess I mentioned, I mean, having worried that they'd be very patriotic and very pro-Aussie. Because I think if it was in England, like, yeah, it would be interesting because the Aussies love their sport. They were really active. They were really looking for the Coxless Fours race. But I think in England, if, if, the, if, if, if the English or the British team lose, then we're terrible. Mm. But if the Aussies, if the Aussies team lose, the other team must be bloody good. And so yeah. actually, even amongst the sort of the locals, like the the acclaim and the like, the congratulations we got was was huge. I mean, I'd yeah, we rode up past those. So you got grandstands on both sides, and so ultimately the medal ceremony is going to be on this side, and that's their friends and family and the rowing crowd are, and then on the far side is 
sort of general tickets. Say a lot of Brits who'd actually travelled halfway across the world, but a lot of Aussies. And we rode past them, and we weren't supposed to. But Steve, to be fair, can be fairly sort of strong-willed when he wants to be. He's like, "I hope we're doing a road past." So we rode up, and there was that. But there was the sort of celebrations afterwards. If you you don't just need a gold medal. Sometimes, if you've got the accreditation, it sort of allows you access to pretty much any party and. Mm-hmm. Olympic host city and yeah, we made the most of it for the for the next week I mean Steve did say to me it was because yeah we're in that subdivided bedroom and because on the morning of the Olympic final because I I'd, I'd still had to look after my back so I'd had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to get Mark Edgar who was the physio out of bed as well so I had to have basically an hour of physio in the morning of the Olympic final just to sort of get me stretched and get me ready so my alarm had gone off at four o'clock on the morning of the and a bit final, of course, I've not been back to my own bedroom for four days. So my alarm's been going off at four in the morning. And Steve eventually comes finds me and goes, Tim, can you come back and turn your alarm off? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, or, albeit I had been back in my room for a couple of nights, but my alarm had already gone off by that point. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. I hadn't even noticed that it was... Sort of... it was that, uh, but no, it's, um, I sometimes suggest yeah, you, you spend... Four, if not twelve years, getting yourself in peak physical condition, you spend about a week losing it. It was, yeah, it was the other thing. Yeah, you spend ten years getting up at five, and then if you're lucky, you get to come home at five. Yeah, <laughs> instead. I mean, again, and don't ever be a men's Olympic marathon runner because you don't start till everyone else has finished. Pretty much. Yeah. So gradually, in the two weeks of the Olympics, more of the athletes have finished, mm. and the atmosphere very noticeably changes. I mean, day one of the Olympics, everyone's got their blinkers on. Halfway through the Olympics, some people take their blinkers off. Come day 14 of the Olympics, most people are... Not of time. Yeah. Um, so it was. I mean, Sydney's a lovely city anyway, but again, they hosted it fantastically. And yeah, it was... And I guess, in, I mean, I mentioned before about how it was like the opening of a new chapter like for us, having lived a sort of a, a blinkered existence, effectively, like even my next door neighbours didn't know what I did because, mm. like, I was gone early morning, like, and yeah, then disappeared for weeks on end. Or, but then obviously they they'd seen the telly and came knocking on my door once I had returned and said, "Oh, you were the guy." Well, never know. But for us, winning the Olympics opened up a whole like. 15, I mean, was it Andy Warhol just stopped about 15 minutes of fame? Like, yeah, we had suddenly these invitations to a world that you never knew was existing previously. So whether it be TV stuff, whether it be kind of West End stuff, whether it be kind of, I don't know, just opportunities to do stuff that you never thought was around. Like yeah. having been just a rower, yeah. it was... They, they weren't being given. They were earned with blood, sweat, and tears over the entire career. And obviously, the the surgeries that you also like had to go through like that's that's not been given at all. No, I mean, I suppose I, I challenge those to say was I lucky or unlucky. I I, I think I was lucky, um, because a lot of people had the same upper, same injuries as me and could not return. And I got some. I was in a position even in the early days where. And I got well looked after. Like even the fact that come nineteen ninety nine, when Matt Stallard says to me, "Okay, you come back on Tuesday," other people have to wait months for that operation. And one of the reasons I think I ultimately able to was was able to recover was because I got the operation so quickly that actually things weren't allowed to get worse before they were made better. That yeah, they were they were bad. Um, yeah, part of it was was me part of it was the people that I had around me but I honestly think I was I was lucky I mean in a perverse way now I wouldn't change a thing you can't yeah because it's all got you to where you are yeah and there were probably hundreds of moments where I would have loved to have changed it but now looking back at it that makes it sweeter there was a quote even on the in the documentary that the the gold fever where I'm about to have the operation I'm in the surgical gown and the the, the camera on and I turn to the camera and say well when I win the gold medal I'll know what I've had to go through to do it and it'll make it worthwhile kind of like is my comment there which 
shows probably how stupid I am, kind of because I'm saying, well, yeah, I'm already sort of thinking about standing at the top of the rostrum at that point, despite the fact I can't step out of bed. But you have to because that's that's how much, that's what keeps you going. Believe that uh, fuels every action. I love the quote: "Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right." Yeah, and uh, it doesn't work for everything, but it's it's a pretty good base rule. Yeah, yeah. if you don't believe you can get there, it's unlikely that you'll accidentally find yourself in that place. How oh, completely? And I have one that's sometimes also difficult to translate in that there are those that want to be the best, and there are those that want to be seen to want to be the best. Mm. And then quite a different. Mm. Oh, I like that. Yeah, like like greatness isn't achieved in front of the crowds on race day. It's achieved in your basement in the yeah. puddle of sweat with no one around yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that was probably the one thing. And I think much credit to Steve, and probably the documentary series helped as well. But the one thing that really wound me up in the build-up was, oh, you're an Olympic athlete. Yeah, what job do you do Monday to Friday? Kind of because they'd assume you'd train Saturday, Sunday, and they had no idea. Or well, Steve Redgrave is so lucky he always wins. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, and actually the documentary series. I think was quite a seminal moment where the general public understood what rowing was about. And I think that was okay, mainly because of Steve. And the reason we had the documentary, Steve, was because of Steve. Yeah, yeah. How was that to be? Presumably you just get told, cameras are turning up, there's nothing you can do about it. We had a, we, we did have an option. Um, but being young and excitable, you thought, oh, someone's actually quite interested in us. Yeah. Um, and actually, we had the right of veto. So... The camera would be would be here, and okay, it'd be up to us to load a tape. And in those days, it was an hour long tape, and um, and their requirement was: sort of, please don't look at it. Yeah. Don't worry if there's nothing on it; just package it and send it to us. So we had thousands of them, but thousands of tapes, thousands of envelopes. As soon as it's finished, send it, send it. So they had loads of just Some of it was absolutely useless because we'd set up here. And then we'd go off and have a cup of coffee and forget. But then they'd still want the tape, just in case. Yeah, yeah. Just in case there was one five-second bit where one of us said something or yeah. some of us did something. Um, but actually, you got, you're quite used to it. Um, I think yeah. the only time, well, one time it was a bit odd, was James had this Danish girlfriend who he ultimately sort of has a sort of longer-term relationship. But when they first getting together, she comes to his hotel room and there's this video camera pointing at the bed. And he's like, no, 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 no. it's for the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, kind of, I don't care who it's for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, okay, yeah, please turn this around. It's like, kind of, especially considering it was James, it was, it was James and me sharing the double bed where the, you know, the camera was pointing towards, it's probably slightly off putting for her, but they managed to get over that. that, that slight hurdle. <laughs> I mean, even like mentioning the bed, even that's crazy. You were talking about how Sydney was uh, the elevated level of professionalism but there's still people sharing rooms and so yeah. two people on the sofa bed like i've never been on any gb camp you know where you, know, you didn't have you shared a room with, with another athlete but always your own bed never would you be like on the floor or on the yeah. sofa like but it, it was i mean even then like james and i decided we we realized our beds could well actually we realized our beds could become a bunk bed because that actually gave us space the bags yeah. because otherwise you literally had no floor space i mean in terms of a room it was Probably no bigger than the end of the table for here and that. Let's say two beds, say two beds in it were left like literally two foot to get yeah. to the door. So we decided to put our beds into a bunk bed, but then James at the top one and it's like, well, how do I get out? So there was a bedside table and um, it was first night we're in there. James climbs on the bedside table, the bedside table completely flat packs. James is naked lying on the floor. Steve and Matthew are like, everyone all right? <laughs> <laughs> don't come in come on, nothing happened <laughs> Why, oh god this, again two days before your Olympics if actually he done himself an injury you think well but it, 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 I mean, it is about the marginal gains I mean yeah for sure there's stuff that we probably got away with because we had to get away with it mm. whereas now you'd try and control it and you'd you'd have a very different environment um, but even I say sometimes I mean, I say I, I, I work a bit in in football now, and I think they've taken it too far. Like, yeah. you go to some of their training venues, and they are perfect in every way, but not optimal. If that makes sense, so that, like everything a player could want is provided for. 
and therefore they don't have to think about anything for themselves. I know uh, a guy used to work for me, uh, Andy Preston, his son was at Reading Football Club Academy and uh, loving it and that's it, this is what I want to do, I want to play football for Reading. Um, but he's found out that what the Reading players aren't and aren't allowed to do in their, in their contract. Um, so like Andy will be like, listen, Drew, uh, come and help me paint the shed. No, no, no. Reading football players aren't allowed to do decorating. They're not allowed to do any home DIY. They're not allowed to pick up tools, like power tools. It's got as much of that because obviously the salaries, the, the, the money is so unbelievable that like you said, like and I guess it's incredible. For- it makes sense if, I don't know, if I, if I, if I miss the nail and break my finger as a goalkeeper, I'm out for a month or whatever. Or put your hand through a window. Put my hand through a window. There is always that. Are we going to oh, start? Are we going to do over that one? Oh, are we gonna, we've got to. We've got to talk about it briefly. Fair enough. So, for those that don't know, we're talking. I don't know either. Uh, <laughs> so we are talking 1997. So I'm in the four with Steve Matthew and James. Um, it's after boat race. So I rode the boat race for Oxford. I'm living in the old boathouse, which is now the Univ boathouse yeah. outside the river. Um, in those days, it was a wooden four-story building, beautiful old, but completely dilapidated building. And that ultimately burnt down about two weeks after I moved out. But that's, that's good. That's a different story. Um, but anyway, what it did have was a club room out the front that we weren't really supposed to go into, but um, it was fantastic for parties because you've got no neighbours whatsoever. Like literally the nearest house in those days was a mile away because the hotel that's now there wasn't there. Mm. Like I was, they were all fallow fields and you had a river on one side and fallow fields on the other. So we had a few parties of which I think this, this was the last for sort of fairly good reason. Um, but we borrow a sound system from one of the colleges. Um, we used to be sponsored by Beef Eater Gin. So we had a pretty big supply of gin. And I think this particular party was, you had to either bring... Um, soda or lemonade and we had two huge vats that were half full of gin and you either poured your lemonade in one or your kind of whatever in the other and um it was a pretty good party from what i can remember um long story short but jay james was there but was quite sensible and left at a suitable time um i will admit i'm enjoying the party and pretty much worse for wear and um, I used to have, I used to wear these rings on my finger, sort of one of which was here, was a big Celtic ring. And I was dancing with a girl who had a sort of crop top on, and then I had to do all sorts of this, and I was thinking I'm a really good dancer, mm-hmm. because obviously sober, I'm not really much of a mover, but after a few drinks, we were like, every move was coming <laughs> off fantastically well. And anyway, I... Don't necessarily remember it, but anyway, I look and I put my hand through the plate glass window. Like what they think happened was I hit the window with my hand and probably my ring shattered the glass. So ultimately there were these shards of glass um, pointing down. I do what the normal person would do and pull my hand back as fast as I could, which they then reckon meant the shards of glass went through my hand. I mean, you won't see it on camera, but I've still got cars from 25 years ago all across the top of my hand so I went through an artery uh, a couple of tendons uh, and yeah ultimately lose two pints of blood um, which the first thing I know is the girl with the crop top on has got this red stripe that's sort of I'm spraying blood everywhere Um could probably tell you the whole story, can't I? Because, yeah, ultimately, I'm thinking, gosh, this is so, try to stop it. Luca Gruber, who was one of my flatmates, sort of comes to help because it's like, obviously, I'm in sort of fairly serious trouble. Um, my girlfriend at the time was a, she was a cop, so she was relative size. So she's tried to carry me outside, which is kind of not easily done. And considering Luca's like the biggest bear of a hulk of a man, you'd think he could have picked me up with one arm, but. The problem you've got is the ambulance can't come within a mile because there's no road access to the boathouse. So I've got to be taken to the hospital. Lucas given me a tourniquet, his favourite Iggy Pop t-shirt, which he's never forgiven me for <laughs> destroying. Um, I go to the hospital. 
Um, ultimately, they realise that it's quite serious. I, um, I mean, I'm by this point, very much worse for wear. And um, cracks a joke that I thought was really funny because they look at it and say, oh, gosh, you're going to have to have some plastic surgery on that. And I turned to my girlfriend and said, oh, perhaps you can get your boobs done at the same time. <laughs> Considering she's just saved my life, probably wasn't the, the nurse administering this. Don't worry, we won't give him any anaesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the two missing pints. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm sure it was affecting my brain. And, but anyway, long story short, they, they, they managed to connect most of the tendons. I lost one to my little finger, um, but managed to sort of re-sew these, get the hand back together. Um, and I'm ultimately released about lunchtime on Sunday. But that, I mean, the whole story was really humbling. Because obviously I've, I've sobered up and I've realised that this is quite serious. I've got a car stalled, press it most of them into my arm, and they released me from the hospital at sort of one o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. And I realised that I've got to walk home through the middle of Oxford, and I'll, I've got I've still got my trousers which are covered in blood. I've lost my t-shirt, so I'm bare torsoed. I had shoulder length hair that was dyed bright red at the time. I've got my arm in a sling. And I've got to walk through the Sunday lunchtime crowd in Oxford. And literally everybody walked on the other side of the road from me. Like if you if I'd have seen me coming, I'd have I'd have crossed the road. And actually I thought. And I think I don't know, and I think and it, it was it was a really kind of I suppose in some ways would I change it? I'd love to change it in some ways, but I learned a hell of a lesson because I'd put myself in a situation where I didn't not do it because it won't make me slower. Yeah. Kind of. Whereas actually I probably needed to only do things that made me faster. Like actually, because the way the others reacted. So there were some people. So it got into, I suppose it was the way of the days. So it hits the press. Mm. So suddenly people are phoning up Jürgen the next morning, eight o'clock in the morning. Oh, I hear Tim's been thrown out of a second floor window was the story that went around. Um, national press are ready to print. Um, obviously, I'm out of contact because I'm still in the hospital, no phone contact or anything. They are due to go training that morning, but I've not turned up, so they know something's happened. Um, Jürgen actually was really good. So eventually when I spoke to him, he goes, oh, I've come over. So actually Jürgen drove to Oxford with his wife actually, and she baked me a cake, which I honestly think, thought I didn't deserve. Um, James, who was probably my best friend at the time and had been at the party, didn't speak to me for eight weeks. Literally, not a word. Because um, he thought not only had I damaged my chances, I'd damaged his. Um, Steve was quite understanding, but pissed off. Um, yeah, I mean, it was my own stupid fault, but the harshest critic was probably me, when well, it was me, because actually, but then it it was that lesson I say, walking through the middle of Oxford was a really humbling, I, I'd gone too far. I mean, I, I'd, I'd gone way, way too far. Um, so yeah, if I'd have seen me walking through Oxford, I'd thought, well, who the hell is that? I mean, it's odd. Oh. Like you weren't, you weren't climbing up on the roof. You know, you were just at a party. These things happen. You know, it's one thing talking about why national teams are so well looked after because this like, I'm, and needing a bit of luck in whatever you do. Sometimes you can get lucky or unlucky. Um, but then the harshest critic thing, yeah, you know, I've, having athletes who've messed up, who've gone out a night out or not turned up and all the rest of it, the next time I see them, they're expecting me to blow my top at them. And I'm like, yeah. there's nothing I'm going to say that you you don't already like killing yourself for. Because I was, because, and okay, the um, the aftermath was I couldn't row. I mean, I, I remember saying to you, because the cast was in the sort of grip line. I said, like, I can still row because like human first, kind of a, so anyway, I, I used to cycle from Oxford to Henley, do some weights and cycle back. And I, again, I could keep myself fit. And um, they, the four, went to the first World Cup, actually with Luca. So Luca subbed in for me. He was the one who sort of helped me hit the party. But he was much fitter, much stronger. And I remember James announcing quite publicly that the four was going so much better because Luca was bigger and stronger than Tim. And I, I, I actually came and Jürgen asked me to come and follow him on the bike at Henley before they went to Munich. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I said, well, do you want my honest opinion? Because I don't need, it's not very good, is it? Uh, and I said, no, it's horrible. Like, they just were misfiring horribly. They go to Munich, they come forth and were way, way off. 
but that just made me feel more guilty. Like, yeah. Kind of, hang on, I destroyed our unbeaten run. In a perverse way, though, and I mean, we're always coming back to the sort of lucky or unlucky. At a very similar time, there was a footballer called Paul Gascoigne, Gaza, who's mm -hmm. anyone in those football would know of Gaza. And he had just gone to Lazio, big money transfer. He'd recovered from one injury, but he'd gone to a nightclub and re damaged his knee oh. in a nightclub. Pretty much the same week as I put my hand through a window, the national press for Paul Gascoigne were like, how stupid are footballers that they put themselves in that position, despite the fact it's an accident? He's a professional athlete. Why is he doing that? And I almost got the who put the window there, but the fall goes much faster with Tim in. We can't wait to have him back. Yeah, yeah. Which actually, I didn't, again, I didn't deserve, but it was interesting how differently that was, that general public perceived. Mm. Like, okay, Aroa, and I hadn't done anything different to him, but mm. I definitely got much better. Especially once they had lost, it almost worked out to be that I got more credit than I had done previously because, I mean, the, the longer story is we, we went to Durham, which seemed really odd in that Jürgen had said he would do the speech at the Durham dinner. Uh, oh, I'll do it next year. And actually they held him to that. I think he was effectively saying no, yeah. but had said, oh, next year. So, but next year they contacted him and said, right, we've booked you some flights and we've booked you some accommodation. So we went up to, as part of our recovery, we went up to Durham for a training camp and actually ended up racing the Durham 8. We were in the 4 there in the 8, and that was fantastic. But actually, it was the first time we'd rode then back together since I'd had the injury. And they punished me because there was an ergo, there was an ergo stand there, and there was a challenge that members of the public could take on one of the members of the 4 over 250 metres. And I stupidly said, well, I'll do the first wave. You guys come off and get some lunch because we haven't had lunch yet. Um, you guys have, grab a quick lunch and um, yeah, I'll hold the fort just at the first cap. <laughs> About 10 times 250 metres later, I can see they're at the back of the room smiling at me <laughs> while I'm now being beaten by any member of the general public <laughs> who cares to come and turn up because I'm completely destroyed, can't I? Um, but I think that was a little bit of my initiation back into the team of mm. like, okay, you deserve this kind of, um, but I, I mean, it was a, the whole injury that I through the window was an episode there that, yeah, I'd love to not do, but actually having done it, it had to be a lesson that I learned from. It was exactly like, yeah, that as I'm, oh, you can't take these things back. The only thing you can do is, is make something worthwhile out of it by change making a change mm -hmm. from it or accepting it and changing it and like I said like it wasn't a fantastic situation but that might have avoided you from doing a city party a lot later to a yeah. different event and things like that so yeah that's it's you can you can get hung up on those things forever whether it's to do with rowing or life or anything like that yeah hey, I wish I could take it back you, know, you can't you can't yeah. it's there it's there it's it's you you either live in your life now wor having had that happened and worrying about it or you're living your life having had that happened and not worrying about it but what you're never going to do is live your life and have that not happen again. Yeah. This is yeah. the only way forward. And the crazier the story, the sweeter the victory. So, like, I'm glad it's all turned out, yeah. turned out well. And 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 it's a, it's a part of a legendary journey now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does fail. I've still got the scars to, to show for it. But, um, it was a good party. <laughs> <laughs> Will it? <laughs> I guess that just finally, I, it would be cool to talk a little bit about your your move into into coaching and the Swiss team and and how you found that. Obviously, we we spoke, you know, before you said about um, being on the other side of it is very different. Yeah, I I think I'd I've not always thought I'd become a coach, and actually, Jurgen was quite instrumental in that. After Sydney, I sort of tried to I, I sort of sculled for a bit and. But I knew I was going to retire, but I just didn't know quite when. And I went into a meeting with Jürgen, and before I'd even sat down, I, and it was the sort of meeting where you kind of had to guarantee your funding. I had to go in, and I was, you know, I'll try and convince him I can do another four years. And, and actually, I hadn't even quite sat down yet, and he goes, Tim, I think he'll be a good coach. <laughs> oh, because that day in my rowing career is over. Um and actually, the second part of it was, because I was, at this point, again, the, 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 the team had slightly split. There was a London group and a, and a Henley group. And he goes, actually, I need somebody to look after the London group. Like, I want you to, list, to, to look after the London group. So we were based out of Imperial Boathouse at the time. 
And I mean, it was a great offer. Like, yeah, one, I knew I had to retire, but I think the difficulty for a lot of athletes is knowing when. And I honestly think, again, I was probably lucky in that my body was telling me it was time to retire. So I couldn't track it on. Um, this offer came, which gave me a, a literal overnight change thing, so whatever it was, the Tuesday I was an athlete, the Wednesday I was the coach, um, and came down and, and coached what were a fantastic group of athletes. But I had built, I would sort of got this idea of what coaching was about, and it was purely based on what I would have wanted a coach to have been for me. Mm. And that was, I think, a mistake I made for about four years was being the coach that I needed mm. or I would have wanted. And it took me a long time to realize that you or others might need. I, I think did. I did the exact same thing, to be honest. Um, because you just think, I love this sport, and there's all these bits I loved about it, and then these bits I didn't love about it. So I'll give someone what I loved about it. Yeah. Um, and I think I made that mistake, especially when coaching people, uh, athletes who weren't as high a level yeah. and sort of wanting like immense success for them. Yeah. They don't even want that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I thought if I showed you the way, you'd take it. Because that would be me. Like, if you told me what to do, I'd find a good reason not to do it. But if mm. you asked me or showed me, then I'd, mm. I'd have the momentum myself. So I was, yeah, that coach, and I, and I couldn't work out why half the group just weren't making any progress and they all weren't doing it or were choosing not to and I actually now I mean I look at Jürgen and I've, I've mentioned him a few times obviously he's instrumental in a lot of, sort of British rowing but I always thought it was a disadvantage the fact that he hadn't rowed whereas now I've actually challenged and maybe it's an advantage in that I think my disadvantage was I came into coaching with such a preconceived idea of what rowing was about and what a coach should be some of which was true, but some of which, which was not. Um, ultimately, I think there is there's there's the benefit of both. But I was asked by UK Sport once to give a, a talk on successful athletes who became successful coaches, and I tried to write a list of all the athletes that had done both. Very short list, yeah, across all sports. So yeah, how many really top players, athletes, performers had become really top coaches? Very few. Yeah, it's not not. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. yeah, the person that gets it the most is not necessarily doesn't necessarily also have the body capable of yeah. doing it. I mean, um, you look at football managers maybe as the most obvious example. Your Alex Ferguson's, your Arsene Wenger's were players that at this level mm-hmm. to become managers there, or actually without naming some of the names, some of the guys I work with now are some very very good former players mm-hmm. that unfortunately are not managers at the moment because they've been a manager and, and all no longer. I think another thing for me, I find it very, very difficult to drop the athlete's perspective mm. and struggled immensely as a coach making decisions to cut athletes because I was always in yeah. their shoes. I always had this, couldn't just be the coach. Yeah, I do. I, the putting yourself in the boat, yeah. like either literally or, or not. Like, yeah. So I guess originally I was guilty. It was, oh, I'll show you. It's easy. Yeah, yeah. Like you just do that. <laughs> like, well, just because I make it easy, look easy doesn't help you learn. But then also, yeah, like if I was in a motorboat or following, I'd be oh, what would I be feeling? What would I be doing? Because that was the role I'd played for a lot of years as that sort of in onboard coach. But yeah, that wasn't always right, or it wasn't. And, and so I physically and sort of mentally had to take myself out of the boat and try and take a different perspective. And I'll be honest, I mean, it took me years. I don't think I ever exactly got it right. But having thought I'd have a head start, it was actually a hurdle that I had to learn how to get over. Yeah, it's a funny one that we only learned um, how we started this podcast that, that Jürgen never wrote. Okay. It's like a fact that we, yeah, had, had missed us, which he just just assumed that he must have. Yeah. Certainly not necessarily to a high level, but, you know, he said that. But I think from what I remember him telling us is he, he basically was taught to coach and then assigned the sport. Yeah, that that actually, I'll admit that the specifics of any particular sport are important, but they're a minor element. The rest of it's people, it's organisation, it's teams, it's leadership, it's creating an environment of culture. That actually, the specifics of a sport are sort of relatively manageable, or maybe it's a big discussion. Actually, I think that's happening in sport at the moment is. The coach of the future is more the 
the manager of expertise mm. than necessarily being the specific expert. And you look at people cross over. Obviously, you know maybe you can say he did or didn't. Do, but Brendan Purcell came from mm. came from um, triathlon, and yeah, there's so much. The base, even the system here, MVQ level two coaching qualifications are equal yeah. above sports. Like you said, there's so much that's the same. You can see people will cross over between sports. Um, but yeah, you know, again, having spoken to coaches and stuff, the 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 bit when you're sat in the boat and you're teaching them to do a few little things a little bit better is really the easy bit in the grand scheme of everything else you do as a coach. Yeah, because I think, I mean, looking at the system now, the British rowing system, it is. Well, it's a fantastic system, but it's from where it was to where it is now. It's so much bigger. It's so much broader. There's so many more elements to it. Whereas, yeah, actually, the coaches back in, when I started, they would be probably former rows or often teachers that did a bit of that were looking after you then there and yeah, helping you catch be that fraction of a second earlier or the finish being a sort of bit cleaner. Whereas, actually, to coach in the system, and, and I guess when I went to to Switzerland, I actually realised that my biggest impact was more removed than it was with one or one or two particular crews. That, yeah, if actually we're going to look at long term success, and part of the challenge in Switzerland was to to create a system. It wasn't just to have a medal or two. It was like, well, actually, how can we um, turn something around that has longevity? Then, um, yeah, my input wasn't on the water all the time often it would be doing the stuff I didn't necessarily like and you know writing documents that's the move from coach to head coach yeah is a, is a big one yeah and actually I mean part of it was realizing by this point I'd I'd got a bit lazy like I was giving athletes a Sunday off not because they needed it but I actually quite wanted it yeah um and actually what they the athletes needed was someone who was a bit more sort of excited and kind of younger um so okay that was the, 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 the what i had to sort of do um and i think you have to be as brutal about that yeah so for me especially in the last year or two in switzerland it was actually other people are better at hands-on coaching mm. than i am because i'm a bit i'm a bit blasé like I, or at one point i was coaching too many people so they're all being coached the same mm. because actually i'm i'm at that point, I was coaching juniors, under 23s, seniors, men, women, heavyweights, lightweights. I sort of had control of everything. And everybody for a week would get catch coaching because I couldn't actually have the brain capacity to think about anything else. And then two weeks later, I'd change my mind and everybody would be getting finished coaching. Um, whereas no matter what your individual needs were, but it, yeah, the challenge was then to get something that, that didn't actually revolve around me. Which yeah. I think as a coach, you have to also be as harsh on yourself. Like as an athlete, would you rather be in the boat that loses or yeah, be involved in the boat that wins? You kind of, um, if it's going to go faster without me in it, or if the boat's going to go faster without me coaching it, then actually that's something I've got to admit. Yeah. I can understand how Jurgen not actually rowing was definitely not too much of a disadvantage because knowing how to coach is a completely different sort of level of skill than it is to know how to like make a bow go really fast and you can always bring an expert to sort of like comment on how to make like those nuanced changes but like from talking to many many people on this podcast everyone kind of like portrays Jürgen as having an individual relationship with like each athlete differently and like sort of knowing how to nurture them individually did you feel like that was maybe something that you've learned from him or tried to learn from him when like adapting to the Swiss team? It would be a strength, I'd say, for Jürgen. I think if he, if you're in his sort of inner core and he gets to know you well, that's what when he's at his best. Like he, probably the bit I struggled with Jürgen initially was when I, he didn't know me that well and therefore wasn't able to individualise his approach and he probably missed a few times in terms of kind of hitting the right spot. Um, I'd love to be able to do it. I, I'd still think if I look at my coaching career, I've not been as adaptable as I'd like to be. Like I try and create an environment. I try and have a relationship with people, but actually it's, it's often on my terms, if that makes sense, kind of rather than being as adaptable as I'd like to be. Often retrospectively, I thought, um, 
maybe a good example. When I was in Switzerland, we had a, a female athlete that was good. She was in our quad. They were winning medals at World Cups, which for Swiss women at the time was was unheard of. And then ultimately she came to me and said, I don't want to go to the Olympics. Um, and the Olympic qualification regatta was was coming up. And I was like, well, I mean, internally I was like, I just don't get it. Why not? But externally, I then had a lot of meetings with her where I tried to convince her that, of course, you want to go to the Olympics. It's fantastic. It's amazing. It's something you've got the chance to achieve, something that Swiss women's rowing hasn't done in ages. But actually, ultimately, she convinced me she was right. And the retrospective point was actually, I'd, she'd probably been telling me that for the last year, but I would kind of blocked it out and I hadn't really heard it um, because I couldn't understand it. And I was like, there was enough evidence to suggest that this is what's going to happen. And ultimately, I put her in a situation where she had to make this horrible decision, which meant in the end, the cause didn't race, let alone qualify, and the other three get sort of very harshly dealt with. Um, and probably I'm responsible for some of that because I should have seen it coming before. And that was an example. Well, yeah, actually, the relationship I had with her was not as good as it could have been because there wasn't that line of communication. I, I thought we were sort of getting on and it wasn't anything bad to it. But she never felt she could be as explicit until she had to be. Mm. That goes back a little bit, like you say, like the openness or the or the, or the ability to say how it is. But um, this, it's like hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And actually, whether if it happened six months earlier, would it mean we still didn't have a fifth athlete that could come in? So yeah, um, it was it was a shame. But it was to me, and I mean, going back to that that, that transition into coaching, there was a hell of a lot to learn that I didn't know I needed to learn, mm. and I don't think I ever got there. Like I, I don't think there is a sort of, whereas I might be able to quote a perfect or close to perfect row or I'd struggle to quote a per, close to perfect coach. But even the ones I really respect have their, their pluses and minus. I think you need to give yourself a bit more credit, Tim, because I've heard many athletes talk about the Tim factor and being coached <laughs> by you and just immediately the crew picking up a few seconds and just like absolutely well, picking up. Don't dispel that myth because I think that, that, that sort of self-perpetuating development <laughs> that, 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 that does come in. I mean, I, I do love it. And actually, the, the main bit of rowing coaching and probably the, the main bit of rowing I now do is with Keeble. Yeah. And... I've been lucky enough to stay involved. I mean, I was at Keeble, albeit now, 10 years ago, and they did finally allow me to row the first year. <laughs> they didn't want me to row the... Can we hear that story <laughs> coming from you? Well, I offered... I came back to do a exec MBA, which would qualify me for two years um, to row the bumps. And the first year I wrote what I thought was a kind of nice, polite email to the, the, the captain as was at the time to say that I've done a little bit of rowing before and actually never rode bumps, so I would be quite interested to... To Rome. Um, I got a polite reply suggesting that, yeah, we've already got a crew and so, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, but no, thank you. And I was like, oh, gosh, that must have a, a pretty good crew. Um, and to be fair, they went from Division Two up until Division One that year. So that was, that was something. But Robin Geffen heard this story. Well, actually, because they asked me, they, the college asked me to give the speech at the boat club dinner that year. And I thought it would be quite amusing to recount this tale. And I, I only got halfway through it before basically the room had turned on the captain. We're about to lynch him. So I felt I'd probably best sort of cut this one short and change the subject onto something else. But anyway, long story short, they got me rowing, racing the second year. I had a phone call with, with Robin, who I thought was going to ask me to coach because I definitely wasn't as fit as I'd been previously. But he said, okay, you want to be to row. So I rowed one year and have coached ever since. But to me, it reminds me how much I love the sport. Yeah. That actually having stopped it being my 24-7 job, which it was in Switzerland, mm. um, and effectively after the London Olympics stopped and did a little bit of consulting, but not much, um, by being involved with Keeble, it it reminds me that it's a lovely sport, that actually there's a, a group of athletes that are yeah, maybe not at the top level, but they're motivated, they're enthusiastic, they're passionate, they're willing to learn, and actually that joking me I mean you mentioned it before but the rate of improvement you get from them compared to say Olympic athletes is chalk and cheese so if, if you make an Olympic athlete a, a centimeter quicker over four years you've done a 
good job if actually by spending six weeks with with the athletes now you could actually make a big difference it actually makes me feel like i'm a better coach but um, i realize it's probably not a lot about me <laughs> yeah working with people who are doing it for the love of it is, is great yeah, and getting back to that start and seeing people fall in love with the sport i like that seeing literally physically seeing them catch the bug yeah over a period of a few weeks is and it reminds me that it's not as much as my career especially in the latter years as an athlete and as a coach was about trying to win and it being a winning game actually it's nice to see people do it because they love it yeah. and they enjoy it and they get so much more out of it than just the bump or the yeah. um the chance to cross the line first actually that i'm a firm believer that the skills you get from rowing is a, it's a fantastic sport but it could be any sport really mm-hmm. your team sport that the skills you get transfer fair into so much and so many other things that it frustrates me slightly and i used to get it a lot in switzerland about Parents would come in and say that their son or daughter couldn't row because they would have to go off and do exams and never did they come back with better exam results having not rowed. It was often the other way around that some of the most successful people I know in the world of business will accredit what they got and the uh, the, the unique selling factor that they've got from rowing because they learned people, they learned teams, they learned um, resilience, they learned kind of trust um all these sort of elements that i think sport gives them uh, i think absolutely and rowing is definitely a hidden gem in the in the way that it harnesses so many skills and abilities like you've just named a bunch of them and other sports definitely could have a lot to like learn from which i guess explains why you now work with i don't know if i'm allowed to say but with like football coaches in the premier league yeah so i guess my my day job now is is coaching football managers so it's a long way removed from the amateur days of rowing. Um, so I work for the League Managers Association, which is effectively the union of football managers. So any professional football manager in the men's or women's game is a, is a member of our association. And not all of them, but they can all access me in terms of um, helping them in terms of becoming better coaches and better performance. Like I, I head up the performance side of the, the association. And... Sometimes that might be going into training grounds and actually observing for a day and witnessing the culture, the environment they set, the way they coach. Sometimes it can be helping to facilitate that they go and see other experts. But to me, it's really fascinating. And I love sport. I mean, that kind of, say rowing was the one I was really sort of good at. Um, but actually, I do love other sports. And, and football, to me, is an interesting challenge because especially at the top end, there's no lack of resources. There's no lack of money. Um, not always the case. And actually, you don't have to go very far down before that that starts to become an issue, which is also interesting. Um, and often not known to the public that, yeah, if you're looking at a the bottom end of a championship or a League One team, yeah, rowing does probably better than they do in terms of finance. So it's, it's relative, but Premier League, um, yeah, money is not an object. But it's understanding what performance is about. So sometimes it might be that you've got all the, you've got everything that money can buy, but you're missing something. And I'm in a lucky position that I can I can come in as an external without a, a tainted football background. Um, like as an organisation, we can call on Alex Ferguson, or we could call on mm-hmm. any former football manager you like to come in and and help. But actually, they are sort of tainted by the football brush, I suppose. So I can come in and say, from my eyes. Like I'd suggest this, that they, they might be able to turn around and say, "No, that's a stupid suggestion," and that's fine. Um, but actually, it gives me the ability to to hopefully give them a different perspective. Yeah, outside the box thinking, I think, is so important and um, so easy to see in so many different areas. Especially if you, you know, even sort of academically, people follow the same system. They go up for the university, they learn how to write, and they say, "Like you really in that in that thing," and that's you can do very well like that. But often, big bigger jumps are made by taking someone who's not from that. Yeah, like you said, he almost has that outside perspective. Almost like Jurgen coaching rowing, having never rowed, and yeah. also I, I guess that's more of your territory, just being a, around elite managers and, and people who are just absolutely just set on success, and all they want to do is win. I guess that's uh, that's definitely like right up the the alley that you, of the people that you want to work with. Yeah, I mean, and I have been lucky, and it, it, it it's been really sort of humbling to sort of see actually they they do listen. Like and, and actually, I think that's a real credit to the sport of rowing. But like rowing is now perceived as 
a successful, tough, professional environment that other sports can learn from. I, I've never had someone to value oh, just a rally, yeah. which 20 odd years ago, yeah, they were asking me what I was doing Monday to Friday because yeah. they had no idea or they thought rowing was drifting down the river on a sunny Sunday afternoon. But actually now rowing has this this, this reputation and I guess I'd sort of come in with that and challenge them. And, and again, I could ask a stupid question that they could say, don't be stupid. Or if their answer is, well, we've always done it like that, I'll ask the same question but word it slightly differently because I, I don't want you to. And actually, that to me is a really nice thing to be involved again at, at high level sport. Um, and actually, to find people again that a lot of the managers I work with are looking for the difference. And if I can help them get, give them the difference, then of course they'll listen. So, yeah, yeah I've you know, been involved in some talks or in environments where I'm thinking, oh, God, like, you get slight imposter syndrome of like, well, yeah. If they ask me, should they play four at the back or five at the back? I'm going to give a stupid answer here because I don't really know but actually the questions I get are actually how should I lead or how should I kind of or what do you think about the training environment or yeah can I learn how to make better selections or how like how would you in rowing cope with this or how do you cope with pressure that that sort of thing is is something I can either relate to my own experience or or just give them a different view upon which they can take or leave I love that. I think the world has so much to learn from rowing and that's also the motivation behind starting this podcast is also just exposing, you know, the psychology of like what actually goes into performing at the highest level and, you know, training and sacrificing and, you know, working in a team and just making for a successful story. So this has definitely been a really, really inspirational chat. Do you mind if we ask a few quick fire round questions to yeah, round up? Of course. I mean, as you might notice, I don't always give quick answers. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, not a problem for us at all. That's perfectly fine. So having rode, competed at, trained at, and visited so many different venues over the years, what are some of your top three favorites? Top three venues? Oh, gosh. Um, Lake Barrington in Tasmania, world champions were there in 1990. But you think about Lucerne of being course in a valley. Barrington was Lucerne three times over. Wow. Middle of nowhere, nightmare to get to, no accommodation. But in terms of rowing, that was that was quite special. Um, not a perfect rowing venue, but in terms of something special, I was lucky enough, while I was at Oxford, we did a race versus Cambridge and the Brazilian team on the Amazon. Wow. That was good. The Amazon was 13 miles wide. Um, but if you're rowing at Cavisham or on the Thames, you don't get dolphins jumping out behind you when you row. That was that was quite special. Um, albeit we sunk and therefore got to meet the fish a little bit closer up than we thought. <laughs> um, and what would be number three for the up there? Um, I'd have to give credit and whether it's whether it is Lucerne or whether it's Zarnan like the Swiss just generally and I, I'd probably actually it'd be a place that people haven't necessarily heard of and I, I visited it last week because it's so beautiful a place called Lauerts and it's a lake in Switzerland it's only about 20-30 minutes from Lucerne but it's like again the perfect rowing course albeit they only allow you to row on it one week a year um, it's got a cliff face size it's like kind of good water but just generally some of the venues i was lucky enough to see when i was in switzerland were just perfect for rowing just wish they'd like to row on them a little bit more often than they did yeah that's incredible that's really nice to hear especially with the dolphins jumping over there that was very very special mm. so if you were 60 70 and you could do one race over again i guess you've already kind of answered that but which one would it be and, and why? The Olympic final 96 would be up there. But the one that probably people wouldn't say or realise was 1990 Goblets final at Henley. Yeah. Um, Martin Cross, well, we were only in the four, so we were doubling up. Anyway, we were in the final of the pairs because Matthew Pinsent and Pete Mulcairn were the other half of our four at that point. 
had raced against this Austrian pair in the semi-final. They had lost, and so it was Martin and me versus the Aus Austrians in the final. Austrians take a length and a half lead. Martin and I row them down gradually, get to the point where we're probably three foot ahead, passing the final grandstand. Austrians put on the final spurt, cross the finish line. Nobody knows the result for about 10 minutes. Photo finish comes out and the Austrians are beaten the spy. Oh. And it hurt. <coughs> um, it also hurt the fact that we had to row the force final about an hour and a half later, but that was going to... Um, but that one I'd love to do because I never got the chance even to row in the goblets again. At least with Atlanta, I got the chance to row the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want, I'd like to ask if you could travel back in time uh, to the kid when they... Uh, you, you as a kid, when you first fell, so you said about 16, when you first really caught that boat for rowing and you thought, this is what I want to do. Uh, if you could go back now and give that kid some advice, what would you say? <laughs> uh, look after your back. Yeah. <laughs> Probably would be the main one. Um, almost in a way, though, I wouldn't try and tell me too much because mm. actually the exploratory part of the journey was hard with the fascination. But if you told me I was going to win then, because I was a slightly odd fanatical rower in that actually when I first got into the junior team I didn't know any of the current national team I wasn't a, a rowing geek and mm. like um because I'd come from so far outside the rowing system I didn't know any of that so I think if he told me I'd probably have got a bit yeah sort of shocked by it all but yeah the honest answer would be yeah Look after yourself a bit better than you did. Look after yourself I got really uh Anne Redgrave gave me a piece of advice when she was like uh no one's ever going to look after your back like you're going to look after your back. Yeah. And it's important to your coaches, but you're one of many things that's important yeah. for them. For you, it's the only thing. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because especially when I was growing up, it was like, there used to be the joke, oh, stretching gives you a bad back because only people with bad back stretch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've <laughs> kind of, gone a bit further than that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is, is good. I mean, but I say bizarrely, because when we were amateur, we would do other stuff, which actually mm. removed some of the propensity to get injured. Yeah. Um, but it is one of the really positive changes I think of now is actually the way we look after athletes. Yeah. I mean, in general, not just... I'm mentioning when you were talking about the speed of which you can get treatment, I once turned up to first session at half eight, my back wasn't feeling happy. I saw Anne at 10.30. And I was in Milton Keynes getting my get my back injected at two thirty that afternoon, yeah. which is and it's like wow, it is wow, yeah. yeah. I mean, no disrespect to the NHS, that's yeah, yeah. no, I think NHS is like six to twelve months waiting yeah. time. So yeah, that's the difference. Last question. Yeah, there's so many questions that I want to ask, but I'm hoping at some point we could have you on again. So I'm going to save them for <laughs> for that time. So let's go with the one that I usually ask, which is it's going to be interesting because obviously you came up in a different era of rowing. Who was your rowing idol and the person that you've looked up to the most? Oh, gosh, that is a really good question. As I said, uh, when I was first growing up, I didn't know the rowers. Like, actually, there was a, a, with a single scholar, Perty Carpinen, who, when I was in the Junior World Championships, the others kept talking about it. Eventually, I had to ask, who's Perty Carpinen? <laughs> I was apparently the many times Olympic single sculling champion, but I'd not heard of him. The one I would honestly say was actually someone I competed against many times, a guy called Jimmy Tompkins, who was an Australian rower, who was in their awesome foursome. And in his career at the World Championships, he won Coxless pair, Coxed pair, Coxless four, Cox four and eight. So he won every single boat type at a certain point in his career. But I love the way he rode. He was long, he was horizontal. Like I sometimes still use his pair with Drew Jin yeah. as a technical example of relaxed law. You won't know that you've seen it, but it's all over social media. You, that, pop, that, yeah. that pair comes up. All there's the a, time. there's okay. a bit, they're in the world championship final and it sort of zooms in on them and they look like they're going for a long paddle because they're so relaxed. And then it zooms out and they're like five lengths up. Wow. <laughs> that was brilliant. It's, and, and actually there was a time, many times I raced him and he was one of the, the guys that stayed at their houses. So I, I raced him many times and sometimes we won. Sometimes he won, but there was what the, the, the race in Henley in 1998. So after I put my hand through the window, the first public race we do is Henley and we raced them in the semi-final and we were confident we'd win and we got out in front and we got a length ahead. 
And about to fall, the, they, the Australians started to push. And I remember having a moment where I thought, if they keep that up, we're in real trouble. Kind of, which actually wasn't a normal feeling. I was otherwise confident mid race. But no, he, he was someone that I'd have loved to have just had a pair. But the chance to row in a pair with, but never did. Amazing. That's incredible. Tim, I'd like to thank you so, so much for your time, for all the stories. And it's been really incredible to, to hear your own journey. And I just really appreciate the talk that we've had today. Oh, it's lovely. I mean, as you could tell, I'd, I'd go on all day. So yeah, I'd love to come back. Hopefully some of it was interesting. So yeah, best, really nice to reminisce. Best thing about starting this podcast is there's only one thing where it's loved more about than rowing is chatting about rowing. And um, yeah, it's been amazing being able to, to hear everything you've done and to see, you know, the point of the um, in rowing that you came through and that and how it's professionalized with you in it. Um, and also, I think like credit to you and those guys in sort of Sydney, Athens, that created the buzz for the next wave of athletes to come through. And as I came through and people around me, there was more people rowing, more people to choose from, like, it's just gone from strength to strength and you know maybe there was a little wobble in Tokyo but you can see how the GB team's doing now like a lot of those guys you know I said we've already had people come on and say say you were the inspiration so um yeah no I just think I think awesome awesome career like awesome to hear hear you talk and uh uh yeah and I appreciate you coming on that would be an absolute absolute pleasure thank you very much Tim so on that note easy there cue the music <laughs>